start with introductions. We do have our uh, our fifth board member here, so we need to do the round of introductions one more time here, which maybe that'll be good to just start that right now so we can we can pass the time. Okay. <laughs> Uh, John Yarker, I'm the Department of Water Resources. Yeah. I get it. Tony Shirt, you can. And I guess Dan Wade here is our new, is our new, is who we're introducing ourselves to. That's not coming all the way down. Okay, I see it. Hi, my name is Rune Thorson, and the uh, name tag says Risk Management. Yep, Larry Grunman, uh, Recreation yeah. Private Citizen. <laughs> Me just uh, Sean Early, Richfield Irrigation District, uh, ad hoc for water supply. Uh, Matt Mantic, citizen of Yuba City, wartime evacuee of Florida. <laughs> Ron Stork, uh, Friends of the River, and Joe, ad hoc. Four Page, representing Congressman Alpha. Curtis Primo, Assembly Member Gallagher's office. Carrie, you want to run the back? Liza Whitmore, Public Information Officer for the Department of Water Resources here in Orville. Uh, John Lehi, um, Water Operations Manager for the Department of Water Resources. All right, you're good to go. Thank you, sir. Melissa right, Hurd with HDR, consultant with DWR. Peter Manning from Council Oak, consultant with DWR. Steve Berrigan, DWR consultant. Sergio Escobar, CNA. Uh, Ted Craddock, Assistant Deputy Director for the State Water Project. Derek Bell, the Sheriff's Office. And I'm Dan Wade, and I'm sure. a new member of the IRB. Yeah, I think we should probably get Betty Andrews, get member done. of the IRB. Lelia Mejia, member of the IRB. Bruce Muller, member of the IRB. Paul Schweiger, member of the IRB. Dave Sarkis in DWR. I manage the State Water Project Dam Safety Program, and I'm working on Task 3. All right, well, thank you. So, in your packet here, we have the, uh, the agenda for today. So I just wanted to quickly go through what we're going to cover today here. So started, we, we put the meeting purpose on here, which this came right out of the charter for our group. And so we're, uh, the idea here is the ad hoc group is reviewing and commenting on these efforts related to the CNA, uh, and on the efforts to develop the, the comprehensive needs assessment for public safety related to Orville Dam and its urban structures. And then for this specific meeting, what we're trying to do is, what our objectives are is, we're providing the ad hoc group with uh, further clarification of what the CNA effort, what, what DWR envisions it to be, uh, an understanding of the revised project plan in light of the comments that we received from the IRB and from the ad hoc group, and then also talking about the linkages between this effort and the water control manual. That was a topic we heard about last time, so we had a lot of interest in. And then we also want to talk about two of the tasks, the task three and task five. These are the tasks that we, we have some work that we're in a place where we're uh, ready to report out on. So, in for the agenda, we're going to get done with the introductions here, our opening remarks, we go through the, the five presentations that are uh, basically very similar to what was reported to the IRB. So this is these different presentations covering the areas that we talked about. After that, then we're going to talk about, look at the, uh, the uh, comment logs. So this is DWR's responses to the comments that the IRB had provided. Take a break. And then we will have the IRB talk about their report that they made after their last meeting with, with DWR, the second meeting between DWR and the IRB. And then we have um, a lot of 40 minutes within the ad hoc group to ask questions of the IRB or DWR about either the responses that have been provided to the ad hoc group's first round of comments or the, the new material that we have here today. And then uh, we wanted to spend about 10 minutes just talking about then the schedule leading up to our third meeting. So when, uh, when different, you should expect additional information and when we're expecting comments back, go through that schedule. And then we have a, an open item for if there are any new CNA related issues that we want to bring up. And then that's our, that's our, uh, then we adjourn. And so we're shooting for 11 o'clock, but we do have a very, very packed schedule. So. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Senator Gallagher for any, any opening comments. Uh, you know, I just want to thank everybody again um, for taking time out of, I know, busy schedules and being here this morning. Um, you know, I think each and every member here, uh, you know, adds a lot to this discussion um, and is going to help make it, help ensure that this 
you know, CNA is, is a robust document that takes into account the, the real needs of, uh, of this area. Um, so, and I also want to thank DWR staff uh, for, uh, you know, for remaining engaged with us, for your, uh, you know, cooperation, for everybody being here today. Um, so, look, I, I don't want to belabor that too much, but I just want to thank everybody for all their um, attention to this. And I think let's just uh, dive right into it because I think everybody's really wanting to, is anticipating the, the summary and discussion of the, the, the next tasks and the second uh, meeting that transpired. Sounds good. So with that, Ted, you're... <coughs> John? Yes. Is Mike getting it? Oh, yes. Yeah, Eric, you want to cover that real quickly just so we... Okay. Last time we did have some trouble with the uh, getting the audio. So you'll notice we have a lot more microphones in the room this time. And so... Eric will just cover a little bit of the mic etiquette. Yes, I believe the co-chairs should have your own lapel mics, and you guys are mic all the time. Um, I think Joey may have one too. For the other members of the ad hot group, you have these four mics here, so you, you just push the button on and off to wait when you're speaking. And just as a reminder that you know when you're speaking to the mic, it works great. If you're not speaking to the mic, it doesn't capture quite as clearly. So, so we may throw out some reminders there. Uh, for the speakers, there's a mic up there. There's a, I have a second room of the mic, so especially when IRB members I have something to say, raise your hand, we'll get a mic to you. And, uh, or you're welcome to grab that one. Okay. We'll make it work. Thank so you. our uh, mics are on now. Turn them off. Yeah, you can turn them off. <laughs> Yeah. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, Ted Craddock, good to see you all today. Uh, so, you know, as a result of the uh, first meeting of the uh, Independent Review Board and also our first meeting with the Ad Hoc Committee here, I, we received some feedback regarding uh, the overall scope of the project and I think a request for you know, further clarification what, what the scope of the Oroville Dam Safety Comprehensive Needs Assessment is. So what we thought we did today in our first couple presentations is uh, uh, drill a little bit more and, and take a little bit deeper dive into the, the scope of the effort and, and then as, as John mentioned we'll get into a little more of the technical studies uh, moving forward. Uh, so, so in June of 2017 DWR transmitted um, uh, formal letters to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the uh, state's Division of Safety of Dams, indicating that we were planning to, to conduct this dam safety comprehensive needs assessment for the uh, Oroville facilities. And at the time, we, we pointed out that over the past decade, there had been um, you know, various efforts underway at the Oroville facilities related to either our Part 12 dam safety review effort, uh, some that, that DWR initiated, such as our you know, uh, equipment reliability efforts that are ongoing. And, and then we, we know that, that you know, we thought it was important in the context of, of the, uh, the spillway incident that we perform a comprehensive review uh, of the, the Oroville facilities to ensure their safety and reliability. And so then in uh, January of this year, we followed up with uh, an additional filing with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the state's Division of Safety of Dams to, to really kind of lay out in a little more detail what we were planning to embark upon. Uh, so we pointed out that this uh, effort was to identify measures uh, to restore uh, the, and improve the safety and reliability of Oroville Dam and the pertinent structures. And then we, we uh, identified the six major tasks that, that we were going to uh, uh, pursue, and that included you know, examination of the, uh, the spillways, their capacity and the ability to handle the problem of maximum flood. Uh, task two was an associated operational review of the reservoir and the, uh, the outflow from both the spillways and the outlet works. Um, and task three was taking a look at the, uh, the gate structure uh, for the main spillway. And then task four was an examination of the outlet capacity of the Oroville Dam facilities. Task five was you know, examination of, of the Oroville Dam embankment and, and the associated uh, dams associated with uh, uh, Lake Oroville. And then task six was uh, is, I should say, looking at the, the instrumentation for the Oroville Dam project. 
So as I mentioned at, at the start of the presentation, we received uh, comments from both the Independent Review Board and the Ad Hoc Committee um, uh, you know, suggesting or recommending, I should say, that we uh, take a, uh, uh, you know, explain in a little more detail the, the scope of this effort. And so this particular slide includes a, a, a quote from the Independent Review Board that just noted that they thought that um, you know, this need for additional clarity would be helpful for the effort to, to ensure that everyone has a clear understanding of, of the scope and, and the, you know, the, of this project. And then additionally, the, the ad hoc committee also provided a recommendation and noted that you know, the term comprehensive needs assessment could be viewed uh, in, in different ways by members of the public and uh, uh, suggested also, or we took this to mean that you know, it was important for us to also clarify you know, the focus of this effort as well. So we appreciate both the boards and the committee's comments in this regard and, and took those uh, to heart as we were moving forward in this. And so our, our overall response to the, the Independent Review Board and the Ad Hoc Committee's comments is we agree with, with those points and, and that it, it is important for us to clarify that the focus of this is on the, you know, an evaluation of the infrastructure associated with Oroville Dam. Um, and we thought, or, or our intention is today to, to get a little bit deeper To get in a little bit more detail on the, uh, the scope of the project, the rationale for selecting the, uh, uh, the focus we've, we've made, and uh, then additionally, um, um, you know, as we, as we move forward, we'll, we'll have some additional presentations that get into that. So when the, the project was initially uh, conceptualized, uh, we use the title Comprehensive Needs Assessment because it's a, a common title that, that our Division of Operation and Maintenance and that we use in the State Water Project for our, our infrastructure evaluations. And it was conceptualized to be a component-by-component component look at the Oroville Dam facilities, very similar to what the United States Bureau of Reclamation uh, does as part of their comprehensive facility review process. And so our plan is to look at the structural facility or the facility components of the effort and then also the dam safety performance uh, consideration associated with those structures. And so from the, the structural perspective, uh, this, this effort's been developed to look at the uh, impounding facilities or the dams, in this case, associated with Lake Oroville, so the main dam and the saddle dams. The headworks would, uh, for the spillway would fall in that category as well. Also take a close look at the spillway um, for the, this project, or the spillways. Uh, additional component is the, uh, uh, you know, the outlet for a reservoir. Those would be commonly looked at as part of a, a dam safety review. And then additionally, the, the instrument, instrumentation associated with the, the project as well. One thing I'll point out here is we did, um, we did include these identifiers after the, the main categories here on this slide and the next slide um, uh, as kind of a designation for the, the, the categories that we're looking at. And, and you'll see in a couple other slides, we included a table to, to help ex explain um, how we're examining these. Then from a performance uh, consideration, the, the types of things that you'd look at and we'll be looking at in this study is the uh, stability of, of the facilities, uh, uh, specifically the dam embankment, the saddle dams, and the, uh, the other facilities. We'll take a look at the, the safety and capacity of the spillways, the, the hydraulic characteristics, We'll also be taking a look at the, um, the, the outlet and, and their, their integrity and the capacity of the outlets associated with the Oroville Dam complex. Um, we'll be looking at uh, you know, seepage and, and leakage from the facilities. That, that's something that's common to a dam safety review as well. 
And then additionally, the uh, uh, surveillance data, the performance monitoring trends, and uh, uh, that information, you know, on how the structure is, is performed over the years. And, and again, on this slide, we've included these uh, designators um, to, as, as you'll see that we've included in the next couple slides, a table and a matrix, just to explain kind of the linkage to the comprehensive needs assessment. Uh, so th this particular slide just, again, lists um, more in a table format the, the uh, designators and the, um, you know, the types of uh, structures we're examining. So um, S1, we've identified as the impounding facilities or the dams. S2, the spillways. S3, outlets, instrumentation. And then similarly, when you look at performance, walking through the, the list from the previous slides, then what we put together just to help um, maybe characterize, you know, how we're, we're examining things in this effort is this matrix table that, that illustrates the, the six main tasks in the dam safety comprehensive needs assessment and then the area of focus from those designators. And so I, our, our intent here was just to show or to illustrate, you know, how we're um, how these different tasks that we're looking at connect back to the, the main areas of study that are typically performed in a dam safety evaluation. So we thought this would be you know, kind of a helpful overview um, as we continue to embark upon this effort. Another thing that um, you know, we've taken into consideration and, and put, put thought to is are the comments uh, from the independent forensic team uh, that reviewed the, the spillway incident. And, and on this uh, particular slide, we're, we're um, you know, repeating at a high level the main categories of, of areas that the independent forensic team identified uh, as important lessons learned for the dam uh, industry in the United States and, and across the world. And, and I, th I think what we wanted to point out is as we were developing our, our tasks that are part of the dam safety uh, comprehensive needs assessment, that you know, these different elements are, are basically uh, incorporated or covered as part of the study as we move forward. Uh, so the IFT pointed out that physical inspections are, are an important part of any dam safety evaluation. Uh, but they also noted that in addition to that, it's important for dam owners to perform uh, comprehensive facility reviews like we're proposing as part of this effort. Uh, they also pointed out that regulatory compliance is another important thing for dam owners to um, uh, uh, do. But you know, additionally, it's important to kind of go above and beyond that. And that's really you know, why we've embarked upon this comprehensive needs assessment is is to you know, take that additional step uh, beyond just pure regulatory compliance. They also identified that um, you know, the failure mode analysis that has been typically done as part of the, the FERC process um, needed to, you know, their recommendation was to expand that beyond uh, just a look at uncontrolled release of the reservoir, and that's our intention as part of this process is as we get into the risk analysis uh, early next year that we'll be taking a look at not only, you know, the embankment and the reservoir, but the structures is, is recommended by the forensic team. And, and uh, then lastly, um, they pointed out, you know, the importance of an owner's dam safety program and, um, and, and having a good dam safety culture in an organization, and that's something we're also looking at in a different effort uh, through the FERC process to to enhance our dam safety program as well. So then, um, you know, we also I uh, heard um, from the ad hoc group, you know, some interest in in some other topics beyond just the the physical evaluation of the structures, um, you know, and specifically, you know, examination of, you know, how we're uh, taking a look at our organization regulatory, the industry framework, uh, the water control manual, uh, update process, use of forecast informed reservoir operations, and, and also um, uh, you know, how, how facility security would be addressed. 
So in our, our, our letter to the ad hoc group, uh, we included uh, some detailed information in a table to address those comments. Uh, we, we appreciate the input, and so uh, just uh, for the purpose of today, repeated that, that table in, in this presentation. Um, John Lehigh, later in the day, will be talking more specifically on the, the water control manual and the uh, forecast and form reservoir operations component, so I won't uh, get into that there or in this presentation, but I did want to mention um, you know, that the organizational side is something that you know, we are looking at as part of our update to the owner's dam safety program. Um, and then additionally, from the facility security perspective, you know, that's an area where we're engaged with um, you know, Homeland Security, uh, Office of Emergency Services, law enforcement, um, entities, um, you know, at the, both the federal, state, and local level, uh, and, and then um, that all rolls into, at least in the case of these facilities, kind of a FERC umbrella and also a, a NERC umbrella as well. And so we have a robust uh, security program that, that, you know, falls into those categories. Um, and of course, there's sensitivity related to, you know, security of the facilities to, to ensure that they're, you know, protected. Uh, so I think we just wanted to, you know, highlight that you know, there, there are some other venues that we're addressing these topics and, and um, uh, you know, we're, you know, as part of this effort, we're a little more focused on the, the you know, the, the uh, structures and, and the, uh, the dam safety evaluation of those structures. So with that, that, that was really intended to kind of be our opening, and, and um, I'll be turning it over to Sergio to kind of get into a little more detail on, on this effort. Thank you, Ted. I want to just keep things moving along. So, uh, you know, what I would say is, you know, look, I think you guys have seen our comments. Um, I think we still stand by those comments that there are things that we do need to think, and, and uh, by the IRB's comments, that we need to think more broadly uh, about these things. Um, and that I understand there's, we understand there's separate processes that govern some of these components, but we believe that the, some of the discussions that we're having here can help inform those, you know, how you go about those things and maybe the strategy that you employ uh, with those things. Um, and so I, I, Speaking just on behalf of the ad hoc, uh, if, if I might, for just a second, you know, I, I still think we need to, you know, and that's a conversation we can keep having going forward, I guess, but, uh, you know, uh, and, I, and I think we're going to get into it in a later discussion here, but, you know, there were recommendations for even having a task seven, you know, and for having, you know, for going a little bit more broadly in certain areas. and. It just sounds like, oh, well, we're going to tighten it back down. I'm just, you know, it's probably something where we're having a little bit of a, I guess, respectful disagreement, I guess. Um, but I want to get into the meat of this stuff, and I think that's really important. Um, so I'll just leave it with that, and then maybe we can go into, you know, Sergio's uh, presentation. Yeah, and we appreciate those comments, Assemblyman. I, I I guess before I pass it off to Sergio, just wanted to say I, I don't think our intention was to clamp it down. I think we were just trying to, you know, clarify what, what the, at least from a dam safety facility evaluation scope um, that we're looking at. But yeah, we're, we're definitely available to talk. No, I'm glad detail, to hear that's not so. the intent. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ted. <clears throat> Oh, okay. Thank you. So I'm not, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in this slide. Ted pretty much covered the, the six topics. Assemblyman, you mentioned a task seven. Uh, the integration team, that's in essence our task seven. So we, we have listened to both you and the IRB. And we have uh, formed, we're not calling it a task because that's more of a at the project level uh, instead of the task level. So it's integration team. So just uh, going back to, to where we started, 
we started in essence as six independent tasks. Um, it was originally envisioned that uh, the various tasks would, would have their own workshops and deliverables. Now, as part of this uh, new strategy that, or new plan going forward, a lot of this work has, has actually been risen or, or elevated to the uh, uh, integration team. That, that's where the bulk of the, the integration is going to take place. Um, so we'll, we'll work closely with the in, individual task leads and, and members of those uh, teams. Uh, but the bulk of the work now is, is going to be performed at the integration level. Um, since uh, we last met, uh, there was some federal legislation that was passed uh, September 10th basically requiring that FERC, uh, um, for the, as part of the Part 12D, um, they require that Oroville perform a level two risk uh, analysis on the complex. Uh, <clears throat> so taking all this into account, uh, we have uh, uh, reworked the work plan and come up with a new schedule, which. Uh, I'll show, uh, that's my last slide in this presentation. So um, this, this slide basically um, shows all the work that, that the integration team is currently working on. A lot of it is what we heard from both the IRB and the ad hoc, the first go around. So we're developing uh, the guideline, guiding principles. Um, developing a project management plan for, for uh, the integration team, uh, developing and tracking comprehensive uh, CNA schedule, tracking independent review uh, board recommendations and uh, CNA responsive, and John is gonna to touch on this uh, a little later. Determining current and future um, without project conditions, I have a slide on that. Uh, identifying what's working well, applying value analysis to the CNA, developing and enforcing CNA quality management plan. That was one of the comments from the IR IRB. Uh, developing strategy for adapting climate uh, change, uh, outlining final report and glossary. So once again, uh, the, the CNA project is, is a study. Uh, you know, we're, we're not developing, we're not at the stage where we're gonna design something. So uh, as, as part of the study, we're, we're, we're going to identify uh, objectives, constraints, opportunities, needs, basically any, any issues. Um, once those issues are identified, uh, we're going to develop, or each task is going to develop measures to uh, address those issues. Once, once the uh, individual task leads have gone through their analysis, eliminated any inferior uh, measures, then the integration team is going to formulate the plans. Um, we could have two to seven plans, we still don't know. Uh, we have to go through that process. Um, those plans will be evaluated using metrics and then uh, compared and ranked uh, appropriately. The, the last item, as, as was mentioned the, the, uh, at the first meeting, um, we, we would then transmit the information to executive and they, they ultimately make the final decision. This is uh, uh, kind of the same thing uh, in a graphical form. Uh, the, the difference is that the integration team is that bar that goes across the top. So we'll, we'll be involved from the beginning to the end. Um, the other item that I like to uh, highlight here is at the bottom, uh, there's that part 12 PFMA for level two risk analysis. It, it's, it's got its own schedule. It's, it's not part of the CNA. However, 
uh, numerous CNA members will participate in, in those meetings and information coming out of it will be useful for, for the CNA efforts. Hey, Sergio, can I just add that that Part 12D risk assessment will have a different board because FERC in their legislation said that we needed to have a FERC approved board so there'll be a board review in that because then that will continue as part of its own Part 12D process, but then be the feeder into our CNA project. Should we need an independent board? It will be another, yeah. Oops, sorry. Another, another independent. Another independent board. So CNA measures, uh, they're, they're basically a feature activity that can implement, uh, can be implemented to address one or more dam safety opportunities. Some examples are uh, modify or, or a new spillway structure, a new higher capacity low level outlet, addition of piezometers to the embankment. Um, you know, we're, we're going to, like I said, have measures for all six tasks. Uh, these are just some of the examples that, you know, are considered measures to, to improve the dam safety. If we do only have that for the last 50 years. Now, the, the measures, um, yeah. th like I mentioned before, they're identified by each uh, task team. Uh, these measures will uh, be looked at or, and reviewed by technical experts on those teams, and inferior ones will essentially be eliminated. The, measure, the best measures will then move, get carried forward or move forward to the, you know, in, be part of the uh, the plans that will be pl put together. So the, the CNA uh, alternative plans, um, the, these are the plans that, that will meet uh, the objectives at some level. Um, and and may, they may include some measures or, or may include a measure from each individual one or they may not include any measures from some of them. So, you know, we won't know that until we actually go through the process. This, is, this graph, uh, or this cartoon I call it, um, sh shows how, how, you know, there's different combinations. So, so for plan one, you know, we're taking a measure from, from each of the six individual, individual tasks. Plan two, uh, we're taking two measures from task one and task three. Uh, the uh, uh, plan three, we're, we are not including any measures from task four. The, the last plan, um, we're, we're including three measures from task one, one from uh, task two, and one from task six. So, so we, we don't have any measures three, four, or five in this one. The outcome and deliverables, uh, a portfolio of alternatives will be, uh, you know, that's basically our outcome. Um, an assessment of effectiveness of each alternative plan uh, using a broad set of evaluation criteria, which uh, we, we have uh, come up with some criteria. It's still a draft form. Uh, we're, it's still a work in progress. But uh, I, I have a slide on what we've come up to date. Um, <clears throat> Identification of, of alternative plans that perform best and themes. So, so when we look at putting these plans together, you know, we may look at water and power deliveries uh, as a theme, uh, operations as a theme. Uh, you know, we, we still are coming up with what those themes are going to be, but th those are a few examples of what they could be. And. As I mentioned before, um, you know, we'll, we'll provide recommendations. Uh, unlike a, a, a planning study where the, there's only one recommendation, we may have two to three recommendations to executive. So the evaluation criteria form work, um, there's, there's uh, lots of um, information out there uh, where they use risk analysis. FERC uh, has their, uh, FERC, the Corps of Engineers, 
um, USBR, they all do risk analysis. DWR has, has been uh, working on um, a risk analysis for some time now as part of the uh, O&M asset management. So, so we're, we're going to take all this information and apply it to the CNA. The um, evaluation criteria that, that we've come up with so far, and again, this is still a draft. Um, we could delete, modify it, uh, you know, what's here. Uh, and more than likely, we will make some, some modifications. But, um, and, and this is not in, in any sequential order of, of importance. These are, these are just, you know, items that we've come up to date. So first and foremost is, uh, you know, protect public and worker safety. Um, we need to obviously comply with uh, FERC, DSOD regulations, um, make them, uh, improve uh, operational flexibility and reliability, follow conventional design and construction approaches, uh, require conventional O&M activities. We, we want to make sure that whenever we design something, we're going to be able to, to maintain it. You know, we don't want to put a design out there that uh, will prevent us to, to doing any maintenance in the future. So we definitely want to make sure that it's maintainable. So on that point, uh, now you're taking into account Assemblyman Gallagher's dam inspection legislation too that now is in the books? Yes. So that kind of be an overview governing uh, how these things fill into place consistent with that statute, okay? Yes. Okay. And on the word conventional, because you know we struggle sometimes with making sure we use the right word, we want to make sure that we come up with designs that are you know easily you know we can op you can operate and maintain but we're not going to go down the road of it's hard we're not doing it it's just making sure we evaluate that it's we're able to do it reliably because sometimes mm -hmm. there's some designs that are hard to maintain but if that's the design we need to go with then we're going to figure out ways to maintain it properly but we're also going to be looking at that aspect of all designs thanks joe the next one is uh, navigate uh, permitting issues successfully. Um, when we presented this information to, to the IRB, uh, one of the comments that they had on this slide was make sure that you could get permitting uh, easily. So we've, we've incorporated that. Uh, assures water and power delivery, uh, implements plan in a timely manner. So, so, you know, if, if there's a plan out there that, that's going to uh, take 20 years to implement and, and there's a better plan that it will take five years, then, you know, we're, we're going to go for the one that's uh, easier to implement. Minimize uh, total cost, uh, you know, construction, no and then failure to perform oppor opportunity costs. Uh, achieves robustness, redundancy, resourcefulness, rapidity, and resiliency. Um, these are comments that the IRB made at the first IRB meeting. Just and sure, you know, the IRB is making comments on this criteria, and this is an area, you know, as the ad hoc group looks at this criteria, you know, would be interested if you're seeing, you know, if this covers what you think should be looked at, or if you have other things that you're concerned about that should be considered as well, that would be good feedback. Well, I know we're just looking at this for the first time right now, so are you looking for some feedback right now, or? No, I, no, well, I th yes, if you had it, but if you also, if you, I think we were talked about, you know, four weeks or so is the window we're expecting, so definitely if, as you guys look at this and think about it, or as we're going through the process as things come up. Mm -hmm. Um, but Are any members, do you have any thoughts just looking at some of this criteria right now? I'd yeah, just one observation is that uh, recreation, since that's what I'm watching out for, uh, is interwoven into both the regulatory requirements and public benefits because some of the recreation mitigation is an obligation of the license. So uh, I want to be sure that's interwoven in there, both as a license obligation as well as public benefit. 
With, with respect to, to the license obligations, the CNA is not part of the license obligations. However, the, the last bullet there provides other public benefits. You know, if, if there's a, a secondary benefit from any of these plans that would benefit a recreation, you know, that's, that's a, another benefit. Yeah, but the point I was making is that recreation mitigation is an obligation of the license. So it has to be taken into account under that part as well as the, the maybe subjective pu public benefit part. If, if it's a mitigation of the license, we are not going to uh, do something that, that's detrimental to that. But what, I guess my, my point was that we, we are not going to implement mitigations that are required by the license as part of the CNA. Hey, Sergio, can I just, I think, Larry, I think the point you're making is also correct. I mean, the fact that when we say the executive is going to make decisions, is we're going to, we're going to come up with our recommendations that are going to throw a FERC and DSOB. So we're not alone. We don't get to make the decision by ourselves. It's got to get approved by FERC. FERC because they're all managing the dam safety portion of it, but also the licensing side, is going to make sure that we're complying with our license on the recreation. So if they believe or we believe there's mitigation on the recreation side, FERC is going to weigh in on that and either direct us or, um, you know, make sure we don't go against our license. So I think it's included in the FERC process that we're going to be making sure we meet our recreation needs. Ron. I think this is an example of the tension that um, we have about comprehensive needs assessment. I think many of us think that um, that uh, perhaps have a more expansive view of what the comprehensive needs assessment should be. Um, and it, it, it seems to me that clearly recreation in and around the dam complex is, is an issue. and. And what's in the license is is perhaps what's in the license, and what's in the relicensed license is in the license. But you may, as part of the comprehensive needs assessment, um, come up with ideas to add or revise the recreation plan in the license. Therefore, um, you know, it it may be a FERC licensing issue, but it's it's still a proposal that could come out of the comprehensive needs assessment and then be incorporated in the license. So I think we have, um, um, we're still struggling, I think, with understanding your conception of what the comprehensive needs assessment will cover and how that sorts out uh, with our conception of it as well as how we work through this. Right. Uh, so I think maybe, would it be correct maybe to summarize that as maybe a criteria could be impacts to recreation? Is that what you're getting at, Larry? Yeah, yeah. But from both the regulatory and public benefits aspect, yes. Right. And, you know, that can, that's just, I think that's one of the comments, right? So. If I may. I, yeah, go I ahead. Don't don't. I, I don't, I think, here we go again. You can't hold everything separate because the conclusions you're going to come to are in some way going to alter the operations of the dam with climate change and the lack of a lower spillway and all that. And that's going to impact recreation from one end to the other because if the lake's held lower longer periods of time, it changes everything in the relicensing, pending licensing re agreement and everything going forward. So again, you can't just box that out. I think Mr. Grumman's entirely right. Ron, you're bouncing around it. The fact is you just can't put it down there. It provides for other public benefits. It will directly impact my community and, and our future. Can, can I just add, because I, I know this is a complicated issue, and I know we've talked about it, and this CNA could get super complex and big really quickly, but this process is studies. And really, it's to come up with concepts and studies that are going to go forward with actual designs and plans. And I think, I think that level at that point is, I think, where we can 
probably going to be able to address more of the actual wreck, especially when we talk about the operations of the dam. If you if you see the tasks we're going forward, that's going to happen through the Corps of Engineers, and most likely will be after we've come up with our concepts on the facility and said we're building another spillway, we're doing this, we're doing that. That's going to go over to that world, and then they're going to start working out. So the recreational changes that come out of a new operation plan will get handled there. I think when we agree with FERC and you guys on what the concepts or the projects are coming out of this, I think we can dive a lot deeper into the recreation. I just don't think at this phase we're going to be able to really get to that level yet. But Larry, we're not going to discount recreation. I think that's that's very important to the State Water Project and Oroville itself. So. And I don't think anybody is saying that we need to dive down deep into the exactly how that impacts recreation, right? I think it's just saying that maybe part of the evaluation criteria is like, hey, how would this potential, how would this particular recommendation that's being made potentially impact recreation. Okay. No, that's fair enough. Instead of just saying other public benefits, I mean, look, <laughs> it's not lost on anybody that water delivery is up there three times. Um, you know, <laughs> it's not lost on me that flood control doesn't appear on there at all. Um, you know, you know, I mean, there's things on there that are obviously seem to be more priorities than others, right? And we're just saying, hey, look, when you consider, you know, these aren't the finals, this is the planning stage, I agree. It's, but in the planning stage, you go, okay, well, if we recommend going forward with X, what are you know, the different things that could happen as a result of us moving in that direction, right? Fair enough, if, if we know of a rec issue at the point we're putting these together, we should evaluate it at this right. time. So. Right. And on first blush, I would say, number one, like combining protects public and worker safety into one bullet point, I think you need to separate those out. I mean, and I'd almost say maximizes public safety would be number one. And then, you know, because there's a difference between the, the general public that's protected mm -hmm. by this dam, and then there's people that work on this dam every day, right, that need to be safe, right, and, and how, they, how they interact with the, op the operations and maintenance of the of the facility that are safe. I mean, so I would split those out. I mean, this is just first blush stuff, man. I mean, I, we've all just seen this right now. So, but point. if that's gonna be the criteria, I mean, this is, I think that's the point of having this group so that we can go, hey man, here, did you think about this? And, and did you think about maybe these things in terms of how we're gonna, because this is a key thing, right? This is how we're gonna evaluate different proposals that come up in the tasks. And if something's not in there, then it might not be accounted for, right? Um, I agree with you completely, Joel, that we're not gonna figure this out exactly what the specific recreational component might be or the specific flood control component or we're not gonna do the manual right here, <laughs> right, for example. But we are gonna try to inform that process, right? Okay. And try to say, hey, this is what we would like it No, so those are good points to and be. I think when they come in, we'll it, build, yeah, I, I think what we're trying to say is we're not trying to tell you how to plan all this impacts out. Just acknowledge that there'll be other impacts. And I totally agree in my notes here that public safety should be first. I, I think that should be, if you want the, to buy in, you want buy in from the public, then you're going to have to put protects public safety as your number one bullet. Because the perception of the public is now Bluntly, we're more delivered, worried about water delivery than public safety or power generation than public safety. So I agree with the Congressman fully on that second point. Thank you. That's yeah, so that's that's yeah. You're, my, yeah, you're my, yeah. almost my Congressman. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Doug. <laughs> no, good, good points. Yeah. And we'll, we'll take that into account. And number one happened to be number one. Public safety is number one. So, okay. Thank you. I just want to say that one of the reasons I know that Larry's bringing this up and, and Bill and, and the people that live here in, in Oroville particularly, in Butte County in general, that it, we, it really, we really need to see the word recreation in these documents because recreation has been, hasn't had an equal seat at the table on discussions in the past 
and it's really impacts so much of our economic viability here and it's so important that I would like to see it, I agree with Larry, some way stated in the evaluation criteria that how does this, these changes proposed affect recreation. Okay. I think it's really important that we get right. that word elevated and we get recreation at the table. And again, forward. clarifying that we're not saying that this is gonna plan recreational facilities for the, Correct. For the dam. Everybody knows that. Right, it's just what we do with the actual infrastructure could impact okay. the recreational benefits of the of of the lake, and so that's just something that should be at least considered. Point taken. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for for those good comments. Uh, let, let me ask another question. We're focused on the the dam dam operation, but. You're taking into account as well, aren't you, the delivery ability of the whole state water project. Now that includes levees and bypasses and other matters that relate to the delivery of water through the system. I think as, as we mentioned last time, the downstream of the dam, now we're getting into the flood control manual and those operations. Mm -hmm. um, we have John here uh, that, that's, you know, more, <laughs> he, he's a lot more knowledgeable right. than I am with, when it comes to that. Yeah. I just want to make that point because they're, they're, sometimes people don't think about that part. I've said, for example, the need to fix the levees and our arguments in the budget to get the money for the levees that, you know, you, you don't need the dam if you don't have a delivery system. So that, that's, they're, they're in, integrated and linked. And we are looking forward to Mr. Lehigh's presentation, so, yeah. Okay, uh, on that note, moving forward. <laughs> uh, so this table is, is, uh, was typical in, in a risk analysis where you have likelihood of cons and consequences. Likelihood on the left, consequences on, on the bottom there. So the, the oval shape, a uh, has a, a very low likelihood and similarly low consequence. Part of the reason why we show it as a noble instead of a dot is because through this process, we're going to be doing a, a semi-quantitative risk analysis. We're not going to do a quantitative risk analysis. The quantitative risk analysis, th those are, are done you know, once you're actually getting into the design efforts. So, um, at this stage, we're not we're not at that level. So, so we're not showing a dot. We're instead we're showing a noble. Um, bubble B there um, shows a fairly low likelihood, but the consequence is very high, catastrophic. Um, so this would be an inferior. Uh, plan and so so th there, there are different ways to 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 mitigate that you know uh if, if this plan had any um say say deliveries or or, or um let me let me step back a way, a way to mitigate that would be to, to maybe modify the operations of the facility, uh, start releasing water earlier. Uh, there's other ways to, to mitigate for, for that, that bubble uh, that's in red and, and move it to the yellow or to, to the green. Um, so so when, when we're evaluating these plans, we're, we're gonna look at all that. Um, the, the goal is to be in the green, if we're, if we're not in the green, be in the yellow at, at, you know, at minimum. The, this chart on, on the right kind of uh, shows how we're comparing uh, the without plan or, or baseline condition to, to, to three different work plans. So with work plan um, one, Whatever uh, measures are implemented, it's, it's going to be superior to what's out there now. 
whereas uh, the second work plan, what, what we, uh, with the measures that, are, that are, would be recommended or implemented would actually be detrimental to the existing conditions. So, so that would be an inferior plan. Uh, work plan three has, has the greatest benefit. So it's, it moves further to the right. So the outcome, as mentioned before, uh, there's going to be recommendation plans that are going to be presented to, to management. Um, it's not going to be a single recommendation. It's, it's going to be two, three, four. We still don't know yet. But the, 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 there will be more than one recommendation. Uh, also, as mentioned uh, uh, at our last meeting, there's, there's going to be some projects out there that, that uh, we could start implementing earlier, some that would have significant benefit, um, you know, immediately. So we, we would uh, definitely start the process with, uh, with the regulators to get those projects implemented. Here's the uh, uh, new um, work plan. The item in green there, that's the uh, Part 12D Level 2 Risk Analysis. That's, uh, that's going to start in January of next year, and it's going to go through approximately the first week of March. So uh, <clears throat> as a result of that and our restructuring uh, of the project, uh, bringing in the integration team and, and doing all this other work, our schedule has extended out five months. I mean, are we good with that, uh, Senator Manager? Senator, I mean, because we had to include the Part 12D portion of the risk assessment, after doing that, that's really that's what pushed out the schedule because we've been say, we had been saying we were going to be done by the end of next year, but including that work, it pushes it out five months to be done with that piece and then the rest of it. I just want to make sure that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I get what you're saying. I, I guess I probably want to know a little bit more about how that Part 12D function interacts with this a little bit you know I mean again it's like we're just kind of learning about this right now you know yeah. so no, yeah I just wanted to make I understand that. that it's like another task you know you know additional work that you have to do right so okay obviously that yeah. you know um, so with that I don't have any objection to that or something. No, I just wanted to make sure it was understood because, <laughs> right. well, you know, as our new schedule starts going out and it shows later than the end of 2019 that it was clear, at least from our perspective, why it happened. It wasn't just us delaying or, or pushing the project back. Do you back. envision us needing to have more meetings? Because I know our yeah. schedule ran us through right. the end of 19. Right. But John's saying, saying yes. We may need to have another meeting or two. I'd expect to. Mark. Yeah, I, I foresee at least two more meetings as a, res as a result right. of, of that shift. What's important is a communication to us yeah. about what's going on. You know, we can like it or not, but if we don't even know about it, then and, and things are prolonged. Well, what's going on here? So the heads up is very helpful. And part of me also, Joe, is like wanting to, because we have a lot of material to cover. Yeah. I think maybe we can talk more offline about yeah, that, I you know, I just, is, but I, but I want to keep us moving mm -hmm. into the... No, program. I understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, can I just ask a quick question on schedule? Yes. Um, so, I need the microphone or not. Uh, last time we talked about schedule and if things take longer than you anticipate, the question was, do we go for the schedule or do we go for the quality? And you guys gave the assurance that we were going to go for the, the quality end. I'm looking back at the work plan that you had and phase three was formulate plan that was scheduled to be wrapped up uh, October 31st, which is tomorrow. When I look at your current schedule, that's been pushed off quite a ways and the, uh, the level two risk analysis isn't scheduled to start up until January, so I'm not sure that that impacted the early portion of the schedule. The other thing that I see on your future-looking schedule 
is you have very short durations for all these tasks. It's like one month uh, for a number of those things. And I think what we've seen to date is that things are taking longer than you think. So if, if now we're in quarter one of 2020, how confident are you that we're going to stay 2020 and uh, have that love, high level of quality? Or do you think it's, it's, we're looking really at the end of 2020, like quarter four 2020, to get the quality to do all these things within this narrow confine that you've, you've denoted? Well, um, ba based on the information we have, we, we think that the schedule is a good schedule. Um, the different tasks, they, they have been working on measures to date. Um, what's part of the shift uh, again, it it's, has to do with the um, shifting or, or restructuring of the, of the project. Um, and obviously, the Part 12D uh, does play a role into it. The, uh, so, so the Part 12D is going to inform the, the CNA. So um, with respect to, to the overall schedule, we, we think that that will work. We will, you know, if, if it starts slipping, obviously we're gonna share that with you. Be, be, you know, we're not gonna, at the last minute say, well, it shift six months. Um, but based on the information that we have to date, this, this is the, the schedule for now. Sure, I, I just wanna highlight the the, the schedule challenges and just make sure that we're, we're striving for the quality uh, and if things are going to take a little bit longer, that they're going to take a little bit longer. And, and, and uh, I appreciate uh, your comment because I do recall that you made that, that comment last time. So we're, we're not going to uh, have quality suffer just to meet a schedule. Um, I, th I think, you know, our, our, our goal is to, to have the best product out there. Thank you. Uh, one other comment on, on that schedule. I, I think this group has a lot of desire to have input uh, during the phase two section um, and phase three. And yet those are so stacked on top of each other that a quarterly meeting may not be sufficient and I'd be open to additional meetings to make sure that we have ample opportunity to comment in the phase two, phase three piece then wait in a quarter and just hearing your recommendations. So I'd be open to additional meetings during that stretch of the I process. Th I think that that's a good question to, to submit. Okay. okay. All right, we are a little Thank bit- you, Sergio. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. A little bit behind schedule, so we should uh, just be mindful of, be mindful of that. So good, mo uh, let's see. On. good morning, everyone. It's not for us. It's for the camera guys. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Um, so my name is John Lehi. I am uh, the um, water operations manager for uh, Say Water Project Water Operations. Um, and, uh, you know, if we are pressed for time, um, you know, if there's not much interest in this particular topic, we can just skip it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what, what, I, what I would like to do is um, go ahead, uh, certainly we're going to talk about uh, the water operations piece as it relates to the CNN, CNA process, uh, but this is also an opportunity to, uh, to really bring in the other uh, flood management activities that are going on and will be going on over the years, and that includes the uh, water control manual update, which is under the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Authority. Uh, but also, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, walk you through what is the more immediate um, uh, plans for flood operations as we uh, get into this first winter um, as part of the recovery process. So let me start with that. Uh, so this is the 2018-2019 uh, the, the uh, winter operations plan or flood operations plan. And so what we need to do is take into account what is the status of the spillways uh, right now. And, and that's, that's, of course, what we had to do last winter uh, when we had a plan out where we had to uh, restrict the uh, elevation of the lake 
uh, because of the fact we had this interim design for the uh, spillway, for the primary spillway. Uh, now we're in a place where, uh, you know, we're in good, we're in good shape on the, uh, on the primary spillway. We have, uh, you know, that last concrete was placed ahead of schedule a couple weeks ago. Uh, we've still got some curing time on that. And, um, but it's, it's looking like uh, December 1st we'll be back in business as it, in terms of the primary spillway. Uh, but what we had put together as part of our plan is um, we need to, uh, before that primary spillway became functional, we needed to uh, take precautions um, and we had a plan in place, we do have a plan in place to moderate any uh, storage gains up until the point that that primary spillway is functional. So that was the um, <clears throat> one aspect of the plan for this winter. The second aspect uh, is very important is the, uh, that the emergency spillway enhancements um, are ongoing. Um, that work is continuing as we go through the winter period here. Uh, we've got the RCC. RCC has a longer curing uh, period that will extend through the winter into the spring. There's some construction, uh, sorry, some structural concrete that uh, needs to be placed as well on that emergency spillway, and that's not happening until the spring. So we have to put in, we have to also have some further um, enhanced flood pool for this season as well. It won't be to the extent as last winter, um, but we do need to ensure that uh, we can continue to be able to manage uh, the standard project flood for which the federal government uh, invested in originally to uh, protect the downstream. And so, um, and, and so we want to be able to manage that standard project flood without to ensure that we don't use the emergency spillway. So um, under the existing flood control manual, there are some routings because we have a shared uh, downstream responsibility with Yuba County Water Agency out of New Bullard's Bar. There, uh, the existing uh, water control manual made some assumptions in it as far as the construction of Marysville Dam. Okay, it was authorized for construction but uh, was never built. Um, and so under some of the routings uh, the, the, between the two reservoirs, um, it did require the surcharge of Lake Oroville under some circumstances and uh, it, in, in order to pass the standard project flood. And so what we're gonna put in place this year is um, an enhanced flood pool that will allow us to not have to surcharge but still meet all of those downstream targets downstream with our operations, uh, joint operations with Yuba County. So uh, I'm gonna show you a graphic of that here shortly. And um, yeah, so essentially that, those are the two primary components for this plan. So this, this here is just the first part of that. And this was, uh, these would be the trigger elevations uh, that we have in place between now and December 1st when the primary spillway will be back in business. And so you can see that we had, uh, the reservoir had been brought down to uh, below 700 foot elevation. We're actually down, uh, I think about six, um, uh, 693 uh, today, uh, but we've got these restrictions in place until we hit December 1st, uh, and that would take us to the bottom of the enhanced uh, flood pool that I'm going to show you here in a second. Um, and, and again, this was, this was a precaution um, uh, until we actually have that, uh, that primary spillway functional, which is December, December 1st. Now, here is a depiction of the existing water control manual um, in the CORS, uh, the, the CORS manual from 1970. And uh, you can see that, so what's shown here is uh, two flood pools uh, where we need to provide vacated space uh, in the reservoir for those very large events uh, that would occur in the winter period. And, um, the degree of uh, the, the volume of that um, vacant space, if you will, the, the flood pool, is dependent upon how much rain and snow we receive in the basin in any given year. So uh, it's also referred to as the wetness index. So um, you can see the curve on the top that comes down to about elevation um, 876 or so. That, that would be the requirement under uh, a drier winter where uh, the soil moisture is very low 
and uh, it would, uh, the, the water basin would absorb those uh, big rain events as they came into the system. Now, as if you're in a winter season, a winter year, uh, then you would expect a much greater response from the same amount of precipitation, you'd see greater runoff because the soil's already completely saturated, uh, there's a good deal of snowpack on the, on the basin, then you would expect a much uh, bigger response on the, as far as inflow into the lake. And so under those conditions, you see a wetness index of 11, uh, then we need to provide uh, a much greater uh, flood pool down to elevation 848.5. Okay, so that's under the existing rules. Uh, now what we're gonna put in place for this year though is um, an enhancement on those existing rules. And so this is to ensure that the emergency spillway would not be act activated under a standard project flood. So this is additional space that we're providing for this year because of the status of the emergency spillway. Um, and so you can see now, <clears throat> we're, gonna, we're gonna come down to, um, uh, right now the plan is still draft, but um, it, we're, it's looking like about eight, 835, uh, 835 and a half feet. So essentially what we did is we, we sized these pools to be able to pass the standard project flood, still meet all of the uh, release criteria that's in the flood manual, and uh, not activate that emergency spillway. So that was the criteria that was used to, to develop these curves. And you can see we also have um, a drawdown for the dry uh, watershed condition as well. Um, the standard project flood is, is, or standard project uh, storm doesn't produce as much, uh, uh, as much of a flood flow um, under dry basin conditions, and so the drawdown is not as not as much uh, for the dry conditions. Now there's a, there's a series of uh, you know you see a witness index of 3.5, and there's one of 11. What's what I don't show here is there's a series of 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 uh, various levels in between those two, um, and so you can see the the uh, enhanced flood pool that we have will gradually increase as we get a wetter and wetter um, uh, basin. The, um, so the task two, um, the, the task two, the operations portion just related to the CNA project as we defined it here, um, is the operations component would be used to compare the various uh, CNA infrastructural uh, alternatives uh, to operations with and without uh, those, those infrastructural improvements. Uh, so, and, and compared to a baseline that will be established. Um, this will, and these, uh, these comparisons will inform um, the alternative rankings as uh, kind of Sergio went through that process um, based on operational metrics. So, for example, flood operations, uh, water supply, uh, elevation related to, uh, uh, would be related to recreation. So those would be operational metrics that would be evaluated in part of those comparisons. Um, and then um, what's, what comes out of the CNA process as far as a new uh, infrastructure would certainly then be rolled into a new, uh, an update to the water control manual. So this, these, whatever new outflow features, um, might come about as a result of the CNA process, um, they would certainly need to be rolled into any uh, new flood control rules that the Corps would develop. So that would be uh, one of many additional um, improvements, enhancements, if you will, um, as part of an update to the water control manual. Um, so we see this as being a multi-year activity and it would extend beyond the CNA process and it has to take into account, again, any new uh, infrastructural changes that would occur as part of the CNA. Um, <clears throat> when we anticipate it, that the Corps would also, uh, of course, look at, well, they definitely have an updated hydrologic record since 1970. Uh, we have the big events that have occurred uh, since then that would help inform uh, an update to that manual. Um, they're required to take a look at uh, climate change effects as part of that process. Um, we also have uh, the forecast informed operations. Um, so we've currently been uh, engaged with both Yuba County and uh, the Corps over the last 10 years in what we call the forecasted coordinated operations, which was really just improving um, 
the communications between the two agencies and, and uh, downstream going through uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, we will go through uh, functional and operational exercises. Um, we have developed new uh, decision support tools that are jointly used by both, uh, both projects and the core um, and the division of flood management within the department. So this has been an ongoing effort. Now what we wanna do is take it a step further into this forecast informed um, operations approach. So we're starting a new program there. Um, the, uh, the core has, uh, you know, the core has been involved in very formal informed forecast operation programs at Lake Mendocino and other places. And it's been, uh, some of you may uh, be familiar with the term FIRO, uh, forca uh, forecast informed reservoir operations. Um, so that has, they formally adopted that. They are actually considering uh, Lake Oroville and Yuba County as, a, uh, uh, as likely candidates for the next round of that FIRO uh, type program. So forecast informed operations uh, is something that could also possibly be formally uh, introduced in the update of the water control manual as well. Um, they'd certainly have to take a, a reassessment of the assumptions for downstream uh, requirements as part of that update to the water control manual. And, um, and certainly, as I said, we'd be coordinating with uh, partner agencies and uh, in, in, uh, in particular, it would be uh, Yuba County. And so, um, you know, they're looking to update their manual as well. And so that it would only make sense that that would be a joint effort uh, to some extent uh, because of the common downstream control points that uh, both projects are responsible for. So a lot of the, all of these components um, would really go into uh, the eventual update of that uh, water control manual. And so uh, that's, that's, that's all I had, uh, opening up for questions. All right, thanks, John. Uh, just starting off, I mean, this, this is an issue I brought up quite a bit, but going back to your graph there where you showed the difference in the uh, flood pool for this year. Yes. Um, in order to operate this project safely, that's the key thing. You know, this is, this is a water delivery project. It's a water delivery project for the entire state. But in order to operate it safely, that current black line does not work. And I will give you the, and, and I'll just, here's the three examples, 1986, 1997, and 2017. Um, that flood curve doesn't work. In, in 97, we had to go beyond our 150,000 CFS out of the spillway in order to avoid getting to emergency spillway. And we know what happened in 2017. In 86, we used all of that 150,000 to avoid uh, going to emergency spillway. It just seems to me, and it seems to everybody that looks at this from just a common sense standpoint, that we we don't have as much of a a, a safe space there as we need, especially when we have high snowpack, uh, when we have a, a lot of snowpack, and so. My, my question is this, you know, doing a full update of the water manual is, like you said, a multi-year process, takes a long time. But you've been able to do a modification here, now albeit under these circumstances that we've had, but you've been able to do a modification that allows for safer operation, you know, giving ourselves a, bu a better buffer. Why can't we just go make that a permanent part of make make that modification per, permanent or some form of that which might be a much less comp might be a less uh you know uh burdensome process as doing a full update is going to be but takes care of really the what i think is the primary issue um at oroville is that the bottom line is we have way too much water that comes in here basically about every 10 years um, and we, we can't hold it essentially. And we end up either, you know, exceeding the 150,000 CFS out of the flood control outlet, or we go to emergency spillway. Either option is not very good, right? Yeah. So talk so, to me a little um, bit about that. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and so 
You know, we absolutely realized, of course, this year that we we're not going to wait for a formal update to the water control manual to make the changes that are Right, necessary. we wouldn't be doing that unless it was at least in somewhat a part of an admission that what we have right now is not good. It doesn't work. No, it, it, ta it certainly takes into account the status of the spillways, absolutely. Um, and but would you also say that right now what we have doesn't work? I mean, just the status uh, quo... I, I don't know if I could say that. Um, I, I do Even know, after experiencing I, those events, you would I, say we're I, okay? I... I, I I think the water control manual is in need of update. I will say that, yes. Right, but doing a full update and everything that goes into that, which is not just this, it's a lot of other stuff, right? Right, correct. Is gonna take years, and yep. we're gonna have all kinds of, the process that it takes, I mean, we'll be here maybe 10 years, 20 years from now before that's finally done, right? In the meantime, we could have other events that's what's concerning to me. And like, if there's a, if there's an easier way to do what you've already done the last two years, um, which is, look, we need more space there in order to operate this safely. Um, when we have these kind of high level, when we have these kind of big water events um, that we just know are going to happen. I mean, we know they're going to happen. It's a matter of time. You know, I mean, I, 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 in my lifetime, it's been every 10 years, it happens. And we, and we act like, oh my God, this is happening again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. To me, that is a, why can't we deal with that maybe in a more efficacious way? Well, we, and we, will, we have worked with the core on this particular plan, and we will continue to work with the, the core in the interim up, up no, until water control. Down down there, and then yeah. Corey. Yep. Okay. Sure. Corey, Corey. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Corey. Yeah. Sheriff. Thank, thank you. That's, that's Ron, sir. we got you too. <laughs> uh, so, um, obviously, uh, I share some of McGallagher's concerns about uh, public safety and whether or not uh, there is enough capacity within the reservoir to uh, accommodate these bigger weather events. Um, I'm interested, and I, I don't think this is the, I don't want to delay this meeting any farther or uh, <clears throat> go too deep into the analysis, but I would like perhaps um, uh, an opportunity to sit down and speak with you and have a better understanding of how you uh, came to um, uh, that increased capacity. You know, what was the analysis process that got there? It, uh, going to some of Gallagher's point is, is that a sufficient amount is that enough and I also recognize and understand the importance of balancing the competing interests of preserving water I don't like the idea of sending water that we need uh, for other uh, purposes like agriculture and recreation uh, downstream um, but in the end of uh, but I also want to make sure that there's enough uh, capacity in the reservoir so that uh, we don't get into a situation like we were uh, here uh, in it seems to be every 10 years and so right. Perhaps uh, we could get together at some other point and I could get a better understanding of that. And um, I would feel more comfortable in terms of, uh, uh, with that understanding, more uh, comfortable in terms of managing uh, emergency situations in collaboration with DWR, but perhaps also uh, being able to advocate for uh, a more uh, expedient and permanent uh, um, solution in terms of where we are in terms of what the capacity would be. There, there are a couple of looming factors here, too, uh, that I think we must account for. One is the impact of fires on the watershed and the absorbing capacity and how much runoff we're going to get because of the fires. And also, the Water Resources Control Board is considering stream flow standards. And uh, it's they're applied in the San Joaquin Valley now. It's been very controversial. It'll be controversial up here too. But that's something we're going to have to contend with, also. Let's get to Ron. He he had a, something. Um, I'm going to give John an easier time. Um, I always I really always enjoy your presentations because they're informative, and I I don't feel alone. You and I have both one of the few people in the world who've actually read the flood control manual, and you've read it more than I have. And I appreciate the department's um, uh, creativity in, in saying, look, we're going to 
have a flood operation regime, a temporary flood operation regime um, that will give us the same kind of protection that the um, flood manual was designed to give us. Um, now, we, we haven't always achieved that in the past, but at least that's an aspirational goal, and I commend the department for, for recognizing that. The, the question I have, or maybe it's just posing this publicly, is that um, I, I had the chance to review um, um, a letter that FERC sent the department noting that the um, um, probable maximum flood estimate is higher than the spillway design and that um, the department should reclassify the emergency spillway as an auxiliary spillway, which presumably means that FERC is less tolerant of having a lot of damage and havoc occur when that emergency spillway is used. So I think um, as a practical matter, if public safety is the um, number one priority of the department's operations at Oroville, um, until you have an emergency spillway that would um, not cause a lot of havoc if it's used, uh, you're going to have to have these interim um, drawdowns of the reservoir more than perhaps we would like, but it, there may be no alternative. Um, so as the department looks at attempting to um, meet the standard, um, if the problem maximum flood has been expanded, the standard project flood is often scaled to that um, hypothetical flood. They're both hypothetical, um, worst case floods for various purposes, the standard project flood for flood water management. So is, does the department expect that um, it will continue to um, want to manage for a standard project flood, even if the standard project flood estimate increases? So, okay, so there's a number of questions there. Um, I like so, that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so first of all, on the, uh, the, the designation of the OG spillway as to is it auxiliary, is it an emergency, quite frankly, I don't really care what you want to call it. I know what it's functions are and what and we need to know what its capabilities are and how does that interplay with what we're trying to achieve in terms of the flood protections. Um, so I don't know what the implications are exactly on, on FERC's, uh, what FERC is mulling over in terms of the naming convention. So um, like You I just said, got the letter, so. Yeah, right. Um, so uh, that's one aspect. The um, as far as the standard project flood, I mean, that's certainly something that uh, the Corps is going to be looking at as part of this update on, on how they're actually going to establish that, that level of flood protection. Now, my understanding with the existing, the existing standard project flood was, um, was developed uh, first, and the, and the probable maximum flood was, was scaled up from that uh, standard project flood in, for the original one. They made some other... Uh, modifications to that scaling. I think they shortened some of the lag times and what have you for that probable maximum flood. So it was actually scaled off of the, uh, the standard project flood in the original, uh, for the original uh, PMF that was, was developed. Um, and so the new one was a different technique um, than what was the original. So that's that's kind of where we are there. I do, now I don't remember. I don't know if I got all well, your. Well, I, I guess oh, as, as far as moving forward as a policy, the, do you want to continue to to operate uh, and to have a facility w with both an operations manual as well as physical facilities that can control the standard project flood of the 1960s or 2000s, 20s? I mean, I, that's, I think, the, that's the 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 question that. I think the department faces. I think there's no doubt that the um, the uh, you know the metric of, of flood protection that's being used currently, which is a standard project flood, that will change. Um, and undoubtedly, I mean, I can't pr you know sit here and tell you exactly how it would change in terms because the core is going to ultimately make that decision. But I would anticipate they're going to be looking at uh, if they're looking at climate change effects, what have you, 
they'd be looking at something. I wouldn't be surprised if it's something greater than the standard project flood in terms of uh, what types of flood protection they're looking at moving forward. Um, and that's, that's why uh, it's gonna be important um, in terms of these additional uh, facilities that, that may be going in, in, in online as well uh, for, that, for that management. Uh, but ultimately they have the authority on that. Um, we are definitely gonna work very closely with them um, in uh, some of the expertise we have and we can bring to the table to help with that. Um, but ultimately it'll be their decision. And the department's recommendation and I'll just I'll just close recognizing we're out of time, um, but it just seemed that this is going to be a big issue, and this is, you know, going to be one of the major issues that the CNA is going to have to confront. And I I hope that the department uh, and the core and uh, this community um, can feel that it's been done well. Can what's I, what's the plan? I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, man, but like, okay, we've we've heard about the interim operation, which I get that's important, but we're here about the long term. Like, so task two, as my understanding is, hey, here's our plan. We're here's what we're going to come up with as our plan for how we want to do the the water manual, and among other things, and how we you know how we do uh, water operations, right? Um, so just saying, well, it's up to the core and man, it's just the core is going to, no, we, we are going into this obviously with a strategy of how we would like this to be done. Right. Um, I don't think that we're just leaving it up to somebody else to decide. I mean, to, to me, this is one of the biggest issues. It's the biggest issue that affects the community every 10 years, you know, is how that is operated when we have, you know, 110% snowpack up above the dam. And, you know, and under this thing, it's at 850 feet. How it's operated you know? and how, the, how we redesign the physical facilities so they can operate better. Right. And so what I want to know from DWR is like, so what is the plan on task two? What is your plan going into that? And, and again, I don't, my question wasn't answered. Is there another way of going about this other than just a full water control manual update? I mean, we've obviously done an interim change like is there a way to go you know making those just a modification to the update rather than doing a full update of the water manual because i don't really i think that's what we need is right there up on the graph you know is we need something that really gives us it's not a flood control versus water delivery issue it's not at all it is this is a water delivery project but in order for that water delivery project to operate safely this has got to be this is this this situation right here can't continue you know i mean so that's my question is what is the strategy how are you guys going to approach this so, so in this the water is, control plan update so this is very important to us and so i don't know if you guys remember the governor sent a letter to the core kind of asking them to if we could expedite and resource, you know, put the appropriate funding so we could get started on this as an expedited, we're getting ready to probably reach out again, and we may be reaching out to some of you to, to help us. But we want to get them on board today. We need to get going on this plan, and maybe okay. So if they maybe, get on board, what do you want to suggest to them? What do you, what are we going to say? This is what we should do. No, I think we need to reevaluate with, with the hydrologist and everybody else. What is the right cur You know, the red, right flood control, and preferably we would have it. We could know that before next winter, so that we can implement whatever we need to do for public safety by then. I don't think right. we're saying we want to wait 10 years. We're right. not doing that. And if you're waiting on the core, I mean. No, no, we're, we need them, right? I've done that in the flood control world. We said, we're not going to wait on the core, right? And we did 1E and we started building the levees in advance. You know, we we're, said, we're not going to just sit around and wait for the core. Yeah, right? we're, we're not going to wait for and the core. And we're definitely going to do it on this. we need the core. Right. We're not going to wait for the core, but we need the core. And so we're going to pound on their door again getting that wanting them to fund because they need to be funded through congress to be able to take on this activity with us in yuba county so we're going to be pushing on them we may reach out to some of you for help 
and it was it was pointed out to me just a moment ago. It would be best to have the core at one of our future meetings here since they're so instrumental in, in this decision making. I mean, we can't having represented someone in the room that could be a part of. Um, the more important thing to me, Joel, is I understand that we need the core, and the core is going to, you know, you have to go through them to do this work, right? I get that. What I'm saying is we want to be part of the strategy of how we're going about doing that. What's the plan? What's the game plan? And I want to help inform that. Um, yeah, so you know, I in agree. In terms of how it, how it should be. And, and honestly, I think in talking to a lot of people, um, there's a lot of concern about just doing a full, full blown up water control plan update because people think that's going to get bogged down with all kinds of different things. And then by the, and by the time we're done, it might not even be something that any of us like, right? Whereas the real problem is right there. I mean, the real problem is, is what happens in the winter every 10 years again. Um, and how do we hone in on that? And take care of that problem, and and maybe just have maybe there's a more streamlined process. I don't know. Yeah. That's why I'm asking you guys. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah I mean, to quite do frankly, that. from my perspective, we need to do both. So we need to look at the long term fix. And and I think one thing we've been talking about with the core, because it is such a long process, we whatever we come up with needs to be a flexible plan. Needs to be able to adapt to changes as they occur. Um, so I think that's part of, you know, as far as a robust solution eventually. But I also think you're absolutely right. We need to, we can't wait for that. We need to have these interim uh, steps, uh, in, you know, to keep the public safety before that time. And I think this has been a good opportunity to uh, use this forum because we're getting some really great in input here. So, um, you know, I can see where we're going to continue to to utilize this this forum for these types of discussions. Now, I think perhaps at some point that the core's process would take over, but we're gonna fill that, I, I can see where this process perhaps fills that gap um, uh, in, in talking about these interim measures. Um, so I think this is a good opportunity uh, for this particular point. Yeah, Ron. Let me just, um, perhaps just for information purposes, the interim plan that you have, you implemented last year and you're proposing for this year, um, is within the authority of the department to implement without the Corps' permission. Um, you have the authority to essentially dig into the conservation pool and create a temporary flood reservation for year to year. You know, if in the department's judgment that's what has to happen because the emergency spillway isn't safe to use. So the, you need the core if you intend to do forecast operations that will conditionally store water in what's currently the core's flood reservation. That's something that you can't violate without a change in the manual. So um, um, to, to assuage Assemblyman Gallagher's concerns, we have and you have we collectively have the ability to make the operations at Oroville safe in this interim time before the emergency spillway is safe to use. And there's various definitions of safe to use. But ultimately, I think if you're going to have the kind of operation you want fully coordinated with, with the Yuba County water agency operations and using some potentially storage into the flood pool on the condition that you release it when a flood is coming, um, you're gonna need the core. Um, and also it's really critical what the infrastructure is. If the infrastructure at the dam remains infrastructure that sometimes causes havoc during large flood operations, um, that's gonna limit what the core will let you do. And um, so the department's decisions and FERC's decisions done even in, in a dam safety complex context are going to have an impact on uh, what the flood manual can let you do. 
So this becomes a very integrated dam safety, flood water management project. I'm, I'm somewhat heartened um, to recognize that the department's beginning to think about this pretty seriously. So um, we just want to be involved in your deliberations. We want to understand um, this um, as thoroughly as, as you do, because to some degree we're representatives. We have to explain this to the public as well. So you got to bring us along uh, so that we understand this really critical issue. Um, and of course this meeting is, is helpful in doing that, uh, but we're gonna have to have a lot more discussions. Matt. Thank you. I, I think you've made a decent attempt to try and get to um, a curve that's gonna handle the standard project flood. It looks like you reduced it by what, 140, thousand acre feet, the surcharge amount that was supposed to be there during the previous manual? It was actually up to 170,000 on the low end. And on the high end, 140? Uh, well, the, the, dry, the dry curve is reduced by 37,000. The uh, wet curve is, is reduced by 170,000. So only 37,000? That's right, because the, uh, the standard project storm doesn't produce nearly the volume of runoff uh, when the basin's dry. And so um, that's why there's a, a difference between what the project, the difference in the runoff produced by project, uh, standard, uh, standard project storm. Does, does the uh, 1970 level um, allow for surcharge? Um, yes, so that was, that, that's what we're correcting for essentially is that uh, some of the routings in the, in the, uh, in the 1970 manual depending on that interaction between the releases from New Bullard's Bar, it does, depending on the centering of the storm, it does uh, indicate that surcharging of Lake Orville would be necessary under some circumstances in, in managing that standard project flood. And so that's, that's the whole reason for this correction is so that we would not have to surcharge the lake during, and, and still be able to safely pass that standard. During a standard project flood? Yes. Okay. The uh, PERC memo that was just released that you probably haven't a chance to look at yet is calling for um, standard project flood and probable maximum flood projections that would um, in increase um, inflows uh, b by quite a bit than what the number from what was it, the 2003 standard project flood and uh, probable maximum flood. So it may be a good idea for you to pause on this plan right now until you fully digest the letter that FERC sent you. And that way you can see if they're projecting that using um, NOAA's Atlas 14 method instead of, uh, what would you use, the uh, 59 method? Yeah, so they were referencing the, the, the new um, probable maximum flood, which, which is for the spillway design. Yes. Yep. Okay. So, but, but it called for increases flows. If you look at, historical floods since the time the dam started until the 97, there's a 65% upward curve. And I don't think it stops at 97. And, and yet you're still basing this off of the storm data that, that only accounts prior to 97. The, the, the NOAA's Atlas 14 accounts up until 2004 and now to be included not just in the long-term plan, but the interim plan. So I, th I think you have an opportunity to sharpen the pencil when it comes to your curves here if you take this new information into account. That's, that's comment one. The next is question for you. With this curve right here, can you walk us through not the standard project flood, but what the probable maximum flood would look like on this scenario? Um, no, I can't do that standing here right now. <laughs> Sorry about that. But I think the point, Matt, well, Matt, one of the things is that's an interim that's just for this flood year, for 1819, right? Yeah, but... But it, for the long it, term, I think, is what you're getting at. The long term, there's a different... Both. Okay. I, I don't accept the curve here for, for an interim because we're not accounting for the adjustments that NOAA's Atlas 14 would put into here and, and, and the fact that I, I don't see how you're going to handle a probable maximum flood with the current state of the emergency spillway. 
you know that that's part of the that's part of the charter of the CNA process is is exactly that but the task in, the task one which is not going to be completed for another year and a half in the meantime we got two more winners we need to get through so we need to get this right and, and we should not just be looking at standard but probable maximum floods in, in that the infrastructure has the ability to handle that so maybe that's something that you could get back to us on after this right yeah I realize you're not going to be able to answer that right now, John, but I'm just, you know, if that's but, something that maybe you could get but, back to us on trying so, to look at that, you know, so, his, his, his point, I think, about using the Atlas, uh, say that again, sorry. It, <laughs> it, it, it's <clears throat> 2004. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I, and I, I don't know, I think is the process that uh, we'll receive written comments and look at a response. Is that the process that we're looking at here yeah. as part of this? We, we could do it that way. Let's make it a writ, yeah. yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. Right. I apologize, I know that took some time, but I just, I, I think it's a pretty important part of all this. Uh, well, we have a good block at the afternoon, or not the afternoon, after the break for, you know, it's for ad hoc for discussion. And so in some ways we're kind of using, we're having good discussion here with the presentations that right. might be a more effective way to so right. I, don't, I don't feel bad about using this time that way. Okay. Well, do you want to keep just powering through here and let's I think get into the next I task? I think so. Okay. So next we have our uh, Thank you, John. task three. It's up there. Coffee, feel free to grab one as you, know, as you need. Okay. Uh, once again, I'm Dave Sarkissian. I'm uh, DWR, Division of Operations and Maintenance, and working on task three which is entitled Flood Control Outlet Enhanced Reliability. And this task is a little unique because it's, we've got an existing piece of infrastructure here. A um, lot of history, a um, lot of studies that have been undertaken, so a lot of information uh, available. Uh, what is task three? It's an overall assessment of the flood control outlet, uh, focusing on long-term reliability of the facility. We're looking at operating systems and the outlet structures, major structural components. So we're defining it as the new spillway chute, the gate structure itself, the adjacent monoliths, which are to the right and left of the gated monoliths, and the radial gates themselves. Uh, as Sergio laid out earlier, um, we're adopting the steps uh, for each task, uh, looking at uh, identifying objectives, constraints, opportunities, and needs. And that's really where we are now. We're still in that process of capturing that information. Um, after we do that, we'll start identifying measures to address those needs. And I, I foresee that step two occurring shortly after the, uh, the part 12 process and PFMA level two risk analysis, which is January to March of 2019. So that's when we'll really have a good handle on, on what uh, needs to be addressed and what the measures might look like to address those needs. Um, at step three, four, five, and six, that's really more at the, the project level uh, with Sergio uh, and that integration team. So our objective, once again, enhanced long-term reliability. Uh, some current constraints uh, that we gotta keep in mind, it's an existing structure. Uh, we need to we, uh, take a look at each measure, make sure and screen it, evaluate it, and avoid introducing additional or unintended risk. So a lot of measures we might identify might say, oh, let's, let's go do this or that. We gotta step back and look at the structure and really understand, is that gonna help us in the long term or actually create a problem for us? Um, we also have to keep in mind that this is in operation, right? This uh, structure is needed every winter, so whatever measures we develop, we gotta think about you know, how achievable are they in the context of flood control and water delivery and water supply. Uh, the structure has 50 years of service, um, as the IRB recommended, we got to take a look at what's worked well. You know, what, what have we learned from owning and operating and maintaining the structure of over 50 years? Let's hang on to that information. Uh, and then also, how can we better monitor the condition and performance of its various components over time? And so we'll take a look at new technologies, new methods to really carry us forward into the future with this structure. Uh, the past years created some great opportunity for data collection. A lot of things we've done we would not have been able to do if the spillway chute was not being reconstructed. 
Um, and so I wanted to share with you some things we've done. Um, we've gotten a look at the drains that are underneath the flood control outlet, and we were able to do that when we were up at the, up at the uppermost interface between the FCO and the chute, and that demolition occurred, and we had the contractor poke around and find some of the, the drains for us, and we got some good video. They looked in good condition. Uh, we also did some load testing of the existing anchors just downstream of the FCO. Uh, and you can see the jack and the setup there. So we got some information on those anchors in, in rock, very similar to what's underlying the FCO itself. Uh, and then when we had the meeting, the field uh, meeting out there, we saw some of these guys in action sampling and testing the concrete and steel of the FCO. And we're going to use that information to really get good a handle on the material properties of the reinforced concrete. Hey, um, Dave, can yeah. I just add, I mean, I, since you guys are here too, I just want to personally thank Dave too, because, you know, while we were trying to demolish the upper part of the spillway and we need, we needed to get going on this, we didn't want to miss the opportunity for him and his team to do this collection of data before we, you know, put new structural concrete. So that was a, a an art trying to coordinate all the work with QWIT and making sure we didn't slow them down, but yet collected this information that was needed for the assessments going forward. So Dave, I just want to say thank you because that was a lot. That was a lot of coordination, but man, I'm glad you guys were able to pull it off. Thank you. There's a lot, a lot of folks that uh, deserve more credit than I do. Um, <laughs> So anyways, yeah, it was really an opportunity, so we took advantage of it. And we were really mindful of Kiewit's operations. Um, we did not want to interrupt uh, the construction. Um, we've been identifying needs through ongoing analyses, and some of these uh, are harken back to uh, Part 12 recommendations from 2014, especially with respect to the FCO and updating our analyses on how it's going to perform during a, f a flood event, during an earthquake. And so we've had consultants doing some pretty rigorous analyses thus far uh, on the structure itself. Uh, those are ongoing, and we plan on bringing those into that PFMA workshop and showing the results of those to the team and understanding how this facility performs under these extreme events. Um, we've had some surveys of, of the Oroville Field Division engineers, mechanics, electricians, and operators up here. These are the people that are familiar with how this facility operates, how it's performed in the past, kind of what issues they've stumbled upon in, in operating and maintaining the structure. So we want to capture all that information and make sure it's, it's, it's on our mind as we, we look at measures. A um, number of inspections, I've got a slide coming up uh, addressing that. Um, and then documentation review and improvement. Um, we have existing manuals and practices. We want to improve those. We want to get to the best practices in that arena. Um, we also are going to look at the operation orders and instructions, uh, make sure those capture all the information that's necessary to ensure uh, safe operation. Um, and then the level two risk analysis, as I mentioned, bringing all this information into that process um, so that we have the best information available to uh, the team participating. Um, we've had quite a bit of work over the past seven, eight years. Uh, we're going to leverage that. Um, back in 2011, we had some detailed uh, structural reevaluation analyses of the radial gates that were performed. Um, we've had rope access structural inspections with the guys on the ropes looking at, at every connection, the welds, the bolts, the coatings. Um, 2014, we did some more analysis on the gates. Uh, then during 2017, during the emergency, um, each time we had a zero flow period of, of enough duration, we had the rope access guys, and these are engineers, climbing those gates. Um, I think we did it three times. Um, and that was just part of verifying that we didn't have any issues with those gates during those, that, those emergency flow periods. Um, following the emergency in late 2017, we had a, a pretty robust maintenance uh, effort out there um, on the gates. Uh, and then in 27, 2018, structural analyses those are in terms of the gated monoliths, the reinforced concrete structure of those monoliths, as well as we've had analyses of the adjacent monoliths that are considered part of the FCO. Um, recent faulting and seismicity studies, we've, uh, once again, over the past five years, in response to part 12 recommendations, we've collected shear wave velocity data up there. We've had uh, investigations of, of faults in the area. So a lot of great information is coming into our hands, um, really to help, once again, inform the PFMA and risk analysis. Um, 
annual gait exercises. We've been doing these every year um, and we'll continue doing them, but collecting that information, seeing what those exercises have, have told us over the years and balance checks of the hoist ropes. Um, that's something that we've been, been rolling into our annual exercises as well, seeing how the gates perform as we raise them, as we lower them, and it helps us detect if there's any sort of binding issues occurring. Uh, operating systems and procedures. Um, we're gonna take a look at redundancy and resiliences, resiliency uh, for power sources. Um, we're gonna look at that critical operational equipment, their condition, and availability of replacement parts. So if we have some obsolete equipment up there, we're gonna take a look at, at you know, getting new. Um, take a look at the operational procedures for gate operations again, and then also stop log needs and operations. On the, on the point of the inspections, uh, uh, I might have missed it here, but one of my first questions when we began to have the problem, I asked, had you done over the decade any boring going down underneath the, the spillway to see what's happened in the degrading under? And when we saw the break, you could see the tremendous void mm -hmm. there. So any boring going on here? Or, or what are your plans to monitor? Because what monitors under there? To yeah, in fact, we wanted to put in piezometers underneath the FCO, mm -hmm. the gated structure. Um, they installed some under the spillway chute during construction, so we'll be able to monitor poor pressures during flows. Um, in order to avoid messing with Kiewit's schedule, we basically had to step back um, and realize we aren't going to get piezometers installed underneath the FCO this season, but it's our intention to get them installed in 2019. And that would, yes, inform us of poor water pressure underneath the FCO, both when just the lake behind the gates, but also during a, a release. Um, the thing that, that we're really, it's going to need to take some, some delicate design and thought is really how we can route the cables for the instrumentation to a point that we can get those measurements and mindful that we're in the bay, there's high velocities with the, with the flows and we don't want to create a risk, right? That's one of those things that we're talking about. We'd love to get that instrumentation installed, but we don't want to do so in a manner that would create additional risk for the structure. So there'll be a lot of thought on the engineering details on that. David, what about the coring that he asked the previous question? Oh, the, oh okay. The, well, when we put in those piezometers, that's an opportunity to mm -hmm. go deeper and, and check the bedrock as well. In the bedrock. Yeah, and that's part of our plan to verify the bedrock. And what we've seen immediately downstream of the FCO has been high-quality bedrock in relative terms uh, for, the, for the spillway alignment. And that's the coring that just got done. Oh, well, oh, there's, well yeah, there has been recent drilling um, by the emergency spillway. Um, that's, I think, I don't know if it's wrapped up, but there are some specific geologic features they wanted to try and chase down by drilling on the upstream side of the emergency spillway. So there's been a tremendous amount of, of exploration um, that's been done over the past year and a half. It's really- and, and I trust you're considering vegetation management too, because that was a, a big issue. Yes, yeah, and, and there's a, some great studies and work done on tracing routes um, that UC Davis, Dr. Harder worked on, and it was very informative, I think, for not just us, but dam owners across the US, yeah. Okay, so how will this be used? Um, you know, measures identified for the flood control outlet will be integrated with those of the other tasks, as we mentioned at the project level. So we envision our task three, we're gonna have a number of measures we'll propose or recommend. Um, we're gonna identify periodic condition assessment and inspection requirements. Those are things that obviously are, are easy to implement. You know, they're, they're things we should live with in the future. Um, the FCO provides for robust control, flood control releases, and we anticipate many measures uh, to be components of the proposed integrated plans. And so my point here is that we know we've got this facility. It's a critical facility. We're, we're betting our money that a lot of our task three items are gonna be included in the integrated plans, because we know we're gonna have this facility in operation in the near future. Um, we could identify smaller measures that would be readily implementable. So those are the things that we say, you know what, we can easily achieve that, let's go after it. Um, and just go ahead and, and proceed with a small project, perhaps even before CNA comes to conclusion. Any other questions? Um, just a couple things, so one, what, if anything, did the examination of those drains show and the, uh, the testing of the anchors? 
did that show anything to you that's of significance maybe for us? The, the drains looked good. Um, the, the way they were built and constructed, um, we, we couldn't see everything and we didn't uncover every single one of them, but those that we did, they look good and, and it gives us a good level of confidence of that they're operable. Um, the other thing is as we do the analyses, we're able to do sensitivity analyses and assume, let's assume the drains are plugged. What's the stability of the FCO under that condition versus there, we have 50% efficiency on those drains. So there's a number of, of sensitive anal sensitivity analyses that we can perform to answer questions uh, and address uncertainties. On the uh, anchors, anchor rods for the radial gates, uh, we've got at this point three different methods of, of testing those anchors. One's uh, ultrasonic, looking for near surface flaws. Uh, the other is called dispersive wave, and that's actually exciting the rod and it gives us an estimate of the tension in the rod, and we can compare that to the actual uh, original design. Um, and then also we've recently had the Army Corps um, use, I believe it's called, um, I believe it's called a pulse echo or guided, it's an ultrasonic method, but they're able to, to look for breaks in rods at depth. Um, I haven't got their results yet back, um, but I've gotten the first two and they look positive. Um, we've, we've able to, to basically uh, validate or get repeatability in terms of the tension numbers we're seeing on the rods. And then also with our uh, ultrasonic testing, looking for near surface flaws, we aren't seeing anything of significance there. But those, th that topic is kind of one of those things. It's 50 years old. Those rods are not going to live forever, so to speak, right? So that's one of the major considerations. Some, some of them have had cracking, right? And we yeah, know that there are. Yeah, there's, there's been two that have, have cracked and failed. But we have engineers, engineering analyses on record uh, showing us the number that, that, we, that we need to maintain safety with those gates. And off the top of my head, I, I think it's like eight or something like that. So there's a lot of redundancy already in those anchor rods, but it's, it's a topic that we're certainly delving into with task three. Dave, can you also talk about the testing of the foundation anchors? I think that was another thing. Yeah, that was uh, on this slide here. Um, so th yeah, when they demoed the slab just downstream of the FCO, you can see the jack and the, the pump and pressure gauge there. So we, we had Kiwit pull on those. And I think we did uh, six, and five of the six um, met the design loads for those. The sixth one, the guy didn't really have the, seat, the jack seated well, so it was kind of a, a dud of a test. So we kind of threw that test out, but it basically, gave us a level of confidence on the condition of the rods and this style of anchor right next door to the FCO. Um, as I mentioned on the drainage, in the analyses we do, we can play around with the efficiency of these anchors and, and make assumptions. Let's assume none of them are there. How's the stability of the structure? If we can assume 50% efficiency, how's the structure? So those are the kind of things that we'll look at, I think, in the, in the level two risk um, in the analyses. And, and Assemblyman and Senator, I know for me, I'm not a civil engineer, so I'm, I'm a lot of times trying to make sure I understand what they're doing. And in this stability analysis that they're doing, which is really the meat of telling us whether we need to reinforce or bolster the, the, the infrastructure, these, this type of uh, testing was really to, to make sure that our assumptions are correct. So this really verifies that this assumption that we're making on how good the, the drainage is or the anchors, that assumption is going to really can change the outcome of the stability study. And so this is all about making sure the assumptions are correct so that the output of the study is correct so that we get the right information so we can make the right mitigations. And so for me, this was really important because if your assumptions are one way or the other wrong, then your answer is wrong, basically, and so this is really going to help us on the assumptions. I'm sorry. How many anchors do you have in total? Oh, underneath the FCO? Gosh. I'll have to get back to you on that, but we can answer that. It's, it's, it's I think, uh, 50 to 100 or so, just thinking about you the... We tested six? We tested six, and of course, we can't test the ones that are actually still part of the FCO. You know, that'd be very destructive. We don't want to do that. Uh, but yeah, that's... And mentioning the like measures, uh, one measure that might come up is anchoring that structure to the rock with new, deeper anchors, right? 
that's a viable, potentially viable measure that may be an outcome or something recommended by task three. Um, and then we'll have to take a look at that and just make sure are we adding additional risk by doing that to the structure. So, you know, there's, there's pros and cons, but that's, I think, a very likely measure that we'll, we'll have at the end of the day. Well, and I think one of the things that, you know, that I think we've all learned is, you know, it's, it's not just what you know, it's what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And what are the risks with what we don't know? And are we okay with that, or do we need to do more investigation so that we do know, you know, and we're not making assumptions, mm -hmm. we're... Yeah, that's what this slide's all about. Let's reduce so, uncertainty, right? Let's, let's collect some data, and let's try and get as much information as we can. And if we could just see, you know, at some point, kind of what, what is some of that hard data that we've collected, you know, and, and obviously for the IRB, obviously that's something that we really need your assistance on and saying, hey, what do you guys think about what we know and what we don't know, right? And then assemblyman, I think this is where the legislation that you guys passed on, on inspections and all that is gonna be helpful because this is also an industry problem, not just a DWR, meaning those means and methods to do, to reduce the uncertainty because of the assumptions. Some of these things are not out there yet, so we really need the industry helping get to that point where we can, so I think, what you did is going to be helpful. This is going to be helpful. And ultimately, it's the whole industry that needs to. We're just at the point where we're kind of leading the charge, and we need to. Well, this is, is Bill, is statewide. Yeah. A lot of dams are going to be inspected now with a great more deal of, uh, of vigilance. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all good. I also wanted to note that our congressman has joined us, Congressman Doug LaMalfa. Thank you for being here. Hey, Doug. Yeah. Hey, Doug. Good to see you. Good to see you. I don't know if you wanted to say anything, Doug. Or... I'll hold. Thank you. Okay. Didn't you have something, Ron? I have a, I have a quick question. Um, your discussion here is trying to look at um, structural stability and reliability and factors of safety um, there at the existing ALBA structure. Um, but getting back to, to the, our, our last discussion about the we're suggesting that overall combined spillway capacity is inadequate for the traditional measures of spillway design plus. Um, I, I, I assume that the flood control outlet structure that we have for the main spillway is not particularly easy to expand um, and that that's um, the most obvious control or limiting factor on the ability to get water through the main surface spillway. Uh, so if what we read is FERC is challenging the department to essentially have higher capacity spillways, if, if that's how that turns out, it's early yet, um, the department's going to have to be thinking potentially of either doing expanding the capacity with the auxiliary spillway or expanding the capacity at the main spillway out of works and the chute um, uh, as a result of that. So you have, uh, you may have more than one challenge to, to deal with here. Yeah, and, and I think task one is, is going right after that issue about spillway capacity. Um, and they get the, the, the fun of really exploring all the different options and, and brainstorming how can we how can we get more spillway capacity um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what they come up with okay thanks all right well shall we move along to the task five with Evales gonna talk us through our last presentation Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Les Harder. Some of you may remember that I used to work for the Department of Water Resources for 30 years. was the executive manager. I've now been a, uh, in the private sector for the last 10, and I'm back as a consultant to the department. Uh, I'm here to talk about the Task 5 status update, and Task 5 is about uh, the embankment reliability. So 
Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is actually stuff that's been ongoing prior to the comprehensive needs assessment. And the background is that there were embankment reliability studies underway um, prior to the Oroville spillway incident in 2017. These studies were initiated after the 2014-2015 uh, ninth FERC uh, five-year part 12 uh, report by independent consultants to do uh, some seepage and stability studies. In particular, there were these two recommendations from, from that independent uh, board, uh, R10 and R18. So R10, recommendation R10, is that the board reiterates that the monitoring and analysis of seepage, including turbidity, are vital aspects of understanding the behavior of the dam, particularly because very limited piezometric data are being recorded in the dam. So that recommendation also had about 10 additional tasks associated with it that were recommended by the board, and the department has been studying those and carrying out those tasks since that time. It's been spending millions of dollars doing that. Uh, a second recommendation related to uh, the first one is recommendation 18. And the board recommends that the issue of potential instability associated with the green spot on the downstream face of the dam toward the left abutment between elevation 600 and elevation 700 approximately be investigated. The investigated should include computational analyses to assess the effects of such a zone on the static and seismic stability of the dam. And this also had some several uh, tasks associated with it uh, that have been underway uh, since that time. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the green spot is, it's also known as the vegetated area. That's quite a shot. There might be only a few of you who might not know what it is. Yeah, I don't think we need uh, At different points in the year, the face, downstream face of the dam turns green, the most prominent uh, location is, is a band about mid-level, goes all the way across, uh, about between elevation 570 and 740. Uh, but it is more concentrated on this portion, uh, what we call the left side looking downstream. So that's the vegetated area. It has, turns green after significant rainfall every year, and then dries up every May or June. And it's been doing that before the reservoir has been filled. So um, how does this all fit in with the CNA process? So the uh, ongoing seepage analyses and stability analyses from the FERC Part 12D process, together with the upcoming new five-year process that's going to start in January and run from January through March and include the level two risk analysis mandated by FERC, that's going to provide important information for identifying the existing conditions of the, of the dam, the embankment dam, uh, existing or baseline risks, and potential improvement or risk reduction needs. And that's all what, what task five is about, is looking at, at uh, what we can do to reduce risks for the embankment portion of the overall Oroville complex. So how do we do that? We have to merge all those studies that are ongoing into the CNA process. So, You've only seen this table three times before, uh, but it's, it's important to reinforce that this CNA process is a water resource planning uh, approach, planning initiative. And we have six steps here over the next two years or so. And steps one through six, we're in step one, as, as David said uh, when he was talking about the FCO uh, headwork structure. We're basically in the identifying objectives, constraints, opportunities, and needs approach, or phase. So that's where we're at. And so we're going to take all the work we've been doing for the last few years on R10 and R18, and then that'll be fed into the Part 12, 12 D process and the Level 2 risk analysis coming up in March, uh, January and March. So this work is going to feed into that process and the results of, of the um, upcoming uh, risk analysis in January and March will then feed back to the CNA to provide information on existing conditions, existing risks, and potential risk reduction measures. 
and those will then be developed under the CNA process under the task five portion of it. Uh, pursuant to Assemblyman's legislation, will this be applicable to all dams that you're going to be looking at? So the Part 12 process, the PFMA, are, is first. already applied yeah. to all dams uh, regulated by uh, FERC. Yeah. yeah. That's the federal yeah. process, yeah. Okay. Uh, in addition, uh, there's a uh, provision in the state water code that requires all DWR dams to be looked at every five years, whether they're regulated by FERC or not, and, and examined and reviewed by uh, a board of independent consultants. Okay. All right, so when we talk about potential failure modes, what we're talking about uh, when we look at that is we look at how could the dam possibly uh, be distressed or even fail. So we think of ideas, what are the possibilities, whether it could be overtopped or internal erosion or slope stability or other seepage issues. So here are some notable ones for Oroville in the past, because we do this every five years. So some of the notable ones in the past is that the zone one core, there's the central core in the dam, uh, might be piping or have internal erosion through broken instrumentation tubes leading to dam failure. So that, that's been looked at before and will be looked at again. Uh, failure of the Palermo outlet, uh, tunnel outlet, that's one of the four outlets out, out of Oroville Dam, uh, leading to erosion of the left downstream groin and failure of the dam. Uh, internal erosion of zone one core due to filter incompatibility with zone two transition. That's actually one of the tasks that the 2014-2015 that the First Park 12 uh, board asked us to look at, and we, and we have been looking at that. Embankment uh, erosion under flood loading on, along the FCO monolith 31. That's where the embankment dam meets up with the uh, monoliths associated with the headwork structure for the control spillway. So that's right where they tie together. So that's a, a zone of potential um, differential movement and potential for concentrated seepage. And of course, potential instability associated with the vegetated area or a green spot, uh, that's something we're, we've been looking at. We have constraints in the process for the planning process for the CNA. We are working with an as-constructed structure. You know, we have to deal with what we have. Um, that structure has uh, different zones in it, in the embankment, and they all have different properties and abilities to uh, hold back water. Uh, one of them is, is the existing conditions, the existing seepage that goes through the dam, the phreatic surface, the surface of the water through the dam, uh, and underneath the dam. Uh, limited number of piezometers, we actually don't have any that are fully functional. Some are partially functional. And we have significant seismic and flood loadings. We are in a seismic area here. Uh, there is an active fault that's right next to the dam. Um, it's potential to give a, a magnitude up to six, six and a half or so. And we, we've already been talking all morning about potential flood loadings. Uh, a lot of these things have been analyzed multiple times in the 50 year history of the dam. Some of them are fairly recent, but some of those analyses are quite old. They're decades old and need to be updated. So that's some of our, our constraints. Uh, we have variabilities uh, under the existing conditions and issues and uncertainties. Um, there's a, there are variabilities and uncertainties in the material properties of the dam. The dam is the highest dam in the United States. It's a mile wide at the top. Um, all sorts of different, there's a range of materials that were put into it. Uh, there is the issue of filter compatibility between the core and the filter. That's something that, that the FERC uh, board asked us to look at and we have been looking at the vegetation area, tow seepage measurements. The dam was designed with a very sophisticated, elaborate system to collect seepage. It is influenced by rainfall, however, and so that obscures some of the, some of the seepage measurements for part of the year. And again, we talked about broken uh, piezometer tubing in the core and embankment zones. What, what does that have, uh, impacts that have on the, on the integrity of the dam? There is a need for more sophisticated seepage modeling, which we actually are, are doing and a uh, need for more sophisticated uh, stability modeling, which we're in the process of initiating. And of course, there's potential issues at the contact between the embankment dam and the FCO monoliths. So we have between R10 and R18, there was about 16 different subtasks. Um, many of them are, are completely done, or 100% complete. 
uh, like for instance, collecting all the available data on, on the properties of the dam. So uh, one of the things that DWR did is went back to its attic and, and microfilm records and collected all the construction data for the dam. So um, during construction, uh, they collected or made tests of density or the moisture content of the fill, the gradation, how plastic it was, and so on. Well, each of those tests is associated with a coordinate in the dam, a location, an elevation, location along the dam at the station, and whether it's upstream or downstream. And a fourth dimension, time, point in time. How many records do we have? 7,000. And so those have been put into a database that can then be queried. So if you want to know one part, particular part of the dam, what the characteristics are of that particular zone for a certain length or a certain upstream length, uh, you can find that out. Uh, you can also use it graphically. This is a, a, a picture of, of some of the tests done in the different zones at different points in time. This is just for the central 500 feet. So like I said, the dam is about a mile long at the top. So if we just look at the maximum section, the say 500 feet in the central area, these are some of the tests done at, at different points in time. So this is a cross section of the different tests that were available, there's data available um, in 1965. And they, they show the, we, we see the coffer dam that was initially placed here, the different zones in the coffer dam, some the core block and some of the beginning of the main dam. So we can query it like that. Uh, we can also look at what it looked like in October 1966, a year and a half later. And so we see the different colors here represent different zones. Each of these is a piece of information about the uh, kind of material that went into the dam. Uh, one of the things you see is the surface here in October 1960, and it slopes down right here right where the vegetation is. Well, this actually plays a role with why this, there is a green spot here. Because what happened is that during the winter of 66-67, uh, rainwater ponded here and tended to uh, result in stratified materials. So that's actually a clue into the history of the green spot. Um, we can query it for material properties. This is uh, information from the downstream zone three, uh, which is the shell of the dam, which is a, a sandy gravel. And what we have here as a function of elevation is all this data. And what we're plotting here is the percent passing the number of core sieve. That tells us how much sand and finer material is in there. So the, the intent, design intent for that material was only to have 25% or less, and most of it is there, is less than 25. But there are certain areas where it got dirtier than that, certain elevations. So there's one here, there's one here, and one here. This is the band of, of where the green spot is. So that, that plays a role in, in part of it. Uh, one of the interesting things is that these are color coded, the red means it's on the uh, left side, and the, the blue is on the right side. We don't see a difference between the left or right. So the, the reason why it's concentrated on the left is not because of the material properties, why that green spot is more concentrated there. But this, is a, this helps us give a picture of the overall dam. And like I said, there's 7,000 of these points in the data points. Was there any degradation over time with the, the metamorphic rock, the, 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 the bedrock, did that hold together pretty well? Um, there, it, it holds pretty, together pretty well. The, there, there seemed to be degradation of, of the, of the, uh, the uh, more friable material when you look at it, right. but I was concerned about the bedrock. So um, the foundation of the dam, the big foundation, they stripped off all the soil off it from alluvium and clue. They stripped all that off. And then for the core of the dam, the, the thing that has to hold back water, they excavated down to get to very high quality rocks, slightly weathered or fresh. So if you remember all those pictures you saw the, of the erosion on the uh, spillway a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. you saw some weathered rock at the top that's kind of brown in color and some pretty good rock that was blue. Yeah but you had to get 80 feet down to get to that. That's what they got to for the core. Yeah. So the core, which is, which is important to hold back water, went down to that kind of rock. And then that rock was treated with concrete, and then the core was placed on it. Yeah. It's and sort so of surprised that, that's, me. That, that part is protected uh, very well. That, that, that went down 80 or 90 feet, I think, to, to hit that rock. Uh, it depends where you are. Yeah. Um, 
in, in this canyon, there was already a lot of erosion, already had removed rock because the river channel was eroding. So you didn't have to, do, to get down to 80 feet there. But sometimes you, the, the cutoff trench for the core is 40 or 50 feet deep. Yeah. Um, and then the rest of the dam had to get down to what they call moderately weathered rock. So the decomposed rock was, was removed, uh, but uh, fairly more weathered, but, but still pretty firm rock was, was used for the base, for the rest of the uh, zones of the dam. And those are covered by the embankment now, so there's no more weathering on, yeah. on top of that. What, Thank what you. What do you mean by those other zones? What would that look like on a map? So, uh, you're talking the first area would be the very river, the river base itself, to a width of how wide on each side did they cut down to the uh, the blue rock? There are. All right. So here's the overall cross section of the dam. Here's the central clay core. They would cut down into the into the rock maybe 40, 50 feet. This, this part here, the bulk of the dam is actually made out of the old dredge tailings from the Feather River, sand and gravel, and cobbles, up to typically about six inches of rounded rock. Um, those are pretty pervious, so it's not necessary to get uh, down to um, the highest quality rock, but all the soil was removed, and all the weathered rock was removed all the way down. So that you know stripping could be Five feet, sometimes it could be 20 feet. How wide is the dam at its base, of north to south? Well, at the top here, it's about 4,800 feet long. So it's... Um, the, the other direction, uh, the river. river like. This way from here to here? Yes. It's about a quarter of a mile long. So this is, this is about 770 feet, and it's about five times... That, that width, so about 3,500 feet, actually closer to half a mile. But that's to the very bottom of the river. Yes, sir. So what you're talking about, when you cut down to that core new bedrock, mm -hmm. uh, what I was talking about is the full width of the dam um, and, and, and the, the river base going all the way up to the, that's the right. streams so like, on the west and the east. So the, I want to turn the dam. 90 degrees and look at it that way from, from your photo there. Right, so it's a V-shaped canyon. Yes, sir. So that core is in a trench, all not only at the bottom, but all the way up the, the sides, all the way up to the top. All right, that's... You've got a plan view on the little plot there, you want to point that out? Yeah. So this is a V-shaped canyon the maximum cross section is here in the middle. And then the core goes all the way across and it's sitting in the rock. The rock was excavated into a trench basically to remove the weathered rock down to really high quality rock and the core sits in that. that that's good information because uh, obviously with uh, the main spillway having evidently built on weathered rock, I think the public would be very rest very well assured that uh, that wasn't the case with the core of the dam. Um, is, there, is there good documents or engineering charts that are still available on that? I know some of these oh, yeah. have gone missing over the years of, of some of the other issues when, the, when this came about. Is that, is that something that could be uh, illustrated with old, old records and old... Uh, Absolutely. So the footprint of the dam was mapped in detail by, by geologists during construction. And then that includes that trench that we were just talking about. And so there's, in addition to that, there's photographs of what that trench looked like and how deep it was. And it's easy to dig, to provide those. Thank you. Okay, I have no idea where I was, but I think I was here. <laughs> um, so anyway, so, some of the other tasks that we've done, uh, like seepage and stability modeling, the, they're in a preliminary stage, intermediate stage. Um, a lot of the seepage studies have been done. Some of the slope stability analyses are just being initiated. So I will talk about this. This is a, a two-dimensional seepage study of the main section of the dam. And uh, this is the computer model right here. It's a finite element model. It's two dimensions, so it, it 
it's a two-dimensional model here. Um, and we put in different properties in, in the dam, and then we uh, model it seepage. And what you see here is in these color codes dip, represent different pressures. If you see these lines, those are intended to be flow lines to show you the direction of seepage. And one of the things you see here is you see hardly anything going through the core. Because the core is basically almost impervious. And so what you see, what you do see is coming in, in the foundation. And it, it then gets up to, this is the river level downstream of the dam. And this is a, an internal seepage collection pool within the dam that's used to collect and monitor seepage. So it's not, all this is dry here, it's unsaturated from the model. And we're not surprised to see this because this material here, uh, very dense clay gravel, and, and you guys are familiar with the cutoff walls that we've been putting in along, in the levees along the Feather River in Sutter, Butte, and Yuba counties. So this core is 100 times less pervious than those, those cutoff walls. And those cutoff walls are only three feet wide in the levees. This core is 200 feet wide at the base. So we don't expect water to go through it. And so that's what the models show. Now, I said there was no piezometers that are currently functional, but we had many that were functional for 35 years. And they show, these, these, are, these dots are are show the locations of, of those piezometers that read information between 1965 in 2000. The system was abandoned in 2000. All of the ones here show with the hollow dot red dry. All the ones with a, a blue dot read this seepage internal pool, which is just what the model shows. On so, that point, visometers, do, do you have a, a budget figure, in other words, what you would need to replace sufficient numbers? Has that ever been requested? Because I'd like to work with you on that in the budget if that's an issue. So the money um, to replace. A lot of the they originally put 56 piezometers in the dam. The purpose of those piezometers, some of them was was just to see how things uh, registered during construction. Mm -hmm. So we don't need all of those back. At least a dozen <coughs> of them were in the upstream pervious zone, and all they ever registered was the reservoir level. And we have better ways to determine how high yeah. the reservoir is. Well, so we don't need to replace all of them. Um, we have been looking at part of our task under the FERC Part 12 uh, recommendations is to look at additional instrumentation, replacement instrumentation. Um, we have a good feel where this, this seepage pool is. We, we track it here at the, at the measuring vault. And we have some indicators still here in, in the partially functional piezometers. Uh, where that pool is. But we are looking at, at new piezometers or replacement piezometers in the foundation and maybe the tap into this pool. And it's quite likely we're going to put some in. And I, I don't think it's a matter of, of, of budgeting. It's just whether or not we need to do it yeah. and whether it's useful. Uh, I will say we don't want to put any in the core because we could probably damage the core if we try and put them in. There's not a need to put them in the core. So we're probably not going to do those. Yeah. Um, but we are going to be looking at that. And I will tell you, I'm pretty confident we'll be putting some in in the near future. Thank you. You're going to have an updated technology for that, obviously, from 1960. Yes. Something. So in previous visits, you, you did, and your colleagues talked about this, these were more seen as temporary construction in, uh, immediately after monitors, not meant to be forever. So you don't just go down there and replace most of those. They're, they don't have a handy access tunnel. You can just send a guy down there to pop in a new one, right? You're going to have pretty, uh, is it going to require Sorry, boring? And, there, uh, you know uh, no matter where we put it, it will require some type of boring. Yeah. Some of the ones that we may be, we're looking at now, there are in the, in the river channel, to minimize settlement of the, of the core, they put this footing for the core. It's called the concrete core block. And there are, con there are galleries in here that we walk to and we, and we inspect on a, on a weekly or daily basis sometimes. And we can drill some of them from here. 
And so we may be looking at, at installing them from here as opposed to drilling them 700 feet that way. So the, drilling them here might be only 80 foot borings. You mentioned the piezometer tubes earlier too, that uh, those could be a uh, long shot possibility of a seepage area, um, correct? Uh, well, um, there are about 200 tubes that go into different parts of the dam from me different measuring areas. These tubes are about that much in diameter, about a quarter of an inch inside diameter. They're plastic saran. Um, a lot of them broke during initial construction and then broke over the years after that. And so one of the potential failure modes I talked about is could, they, could there be concentrated seepage along them or in and around them? And that's one of the things that has been looked at uh, over time. Um, did that answer your question? I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I get where I was getting to with it. Is it do they have a, um, do they terminate in a surface area where you could uh, force some type of material down them to basically plug them if you, if you could find them and access them? Or are they all internally inside that you? you well, they all have ends, and, and they have ends either here in this gallery here, or there's an instrument house here where half of them end. And we did look at potentially grouting them up over time. And the kind of grout that you would have, have to do it is, is, is a, basically a chemical grout. And we did test at DVR's lab about the uh, practicality of trying to do that. Some of these tubes are 1,000 feet long, and they have multiple breaks in them, and we don't know where all the breaks are. And what we decided is that we could probably seal up the ends, but that would still let water into, into different areas that we couldn't see. So we decided instead to cut them and let water drip, drip out of them so we could observe that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so that was better than plugging them off and not knowing where the water would go. Good. So I'm taking up too much of your time, sorry. Um, I'll try and speed this up. I will say, um, so this is a, this is a two-dimensional model. Just, it just represents the cross-section, the maximum section. We are developing a three-dimensional seepage model to look at seepage. So this is, this is the uh, topography of the model in the computer. And this is some of the elements that represent different properties. This is the largest model, 3D model, that the software company has ever tried to, to model. Uh, we're working with uh, uh, Soil Vision, a vendor that, that has three-dimensional seepage analyses. This is the biggest model they've ever tried, and uh, we're trying to make it work right now. So more to come on that. We have gone back to look at the history of the vegetated area, the green spot. So I told you it was there before construction um, was completed, before there was a reservoir. So this is a photograph of the dam under construction in January 1967. The dam's only partly built, and we see the wet spots. Well, where are these wet spots coming from? It's from precipitation, from rain. It's falling on the surface, and it's getting perched on, on some of the dirtier layers here, and it's coming out on the face. So this is, this was doing this, this, this seepage here, and, there's no reservoir. It's not coming through the core. This is all rainwater. And people understood it at the time. Safety dams inspection reports from the 60s show that this is what it was. DWR knew what it was. Um, monitor it. We saw water ponding on the fill. Oh, this is water ponds here. Um, all long before there was a reservoir. And and again, this is 1967. When this was built in the winter of 66 and 67, that, that, that green spot area was one of the wettest winters for Oroville, 40 inches of rain in, in that, that season. And that resulted or helped create these stratified layers that make this seepage band wetter than usual. And it gets green every, um, Every time it starts raining, like in December or so, and stays green until late May, and by June or so, it is bone dry. So um, this has been reviewed. This issue has been reviewed 
since it first started turning green and the first five year FERC uh, independent board of consultants looked at this in 1973, uh, five years after initial filling, and they concluded uh, with the department's position that this is a precipitation uh, uh, behavior, not a seepage behavior from the, through the core. What year was the first year the lake reached the level it was higher than that elevation? 1968. 68 was that year it filled. Right. So you have at least two years worth of data that shows it was green before there was water behind the dam. Yep. So the, um, most recently we presented some of these findings for the Board of Consultants for the Spillway Recovery Team last year. And they also concurred that it was um, precipitation related, not seepage. Um, the last year, the department published this document, it's a 27 page document about some of the seepage and uh, conditions in the dam, the different zones, how seepage is controlled, and about the history of the green spot and the rainfall and precipitation. So this, is, this was all distributed out a year ago. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we can send it to you if you're interested. Um, next steps for us is to, on task five, is to complete these studies and look at other aspects, not just seepage and, and slope stability, but maybe things like earthquake or preferred seepage in different areas. Um, use the results of the of these studies to inform the, the upcoming risk analyses and, and PFMA process for FERC in January to, to March and then use them to identify what are, what are the existing risks and where are the needs for potential risk reduction measures. Sorry to take up your time. No, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thanks, yes. Right, it's not Can a waste, a it's an important issue. Yeah. Less on your variability of material properties and damn material slide. What's the significance of the dashed black line? So the, so again, this is a plot of data. The plot is a function of elevation, so the top of the dam is about here at 9.2. Um, this is percent passing the number four, sieve, which is telling us how much sand and finer material is in the trip. So this magic line of 25% was the specification limit that was originally set during the design said that we, we, the designers, don't, don't want to see anything dirtier that would be to the right here of this line. In the event we borrow that they, that they pitch, there are several borrow areas along the river, these were dredge, dredge tailings in the, in the 20th century gold dredging, um, was dirtier than they anticipated. So as a result of this, because it got dirtier than they anticipated, they put in an extra drain. So there's a downstream, uh, vertical drain in the fill of zone five that they put in to intercept any seepage. Um, that's this drain right here. They put that in as a result of it getting dirtier up. But to answer your question, is that was the other spec on it for the, uh, for the zone three material. Okay. So, I mean, I guess what I'm interpreting from your presentation, Les, is based on this model, which I'm assuming is based on whatever instrumentalities we have to be able to check seepage, shows that there's been no seepage on the uh, non-reservoir side. So, is that right? Well, I didn't say zero. There's some. Well, why is it all white then? Well, there's... because what happens is it, it, it basically comes through here, and I want to say when, I, when it comes through, it's weeping. There's only a few gallons per minute coming through the core. Okay. And then what happens is it hits the pervious zone. These materials are a million times more pervious than the core. So what happens is that as soon as it hits those materials, it just drops down to the bottom and just rides the rock here. And it, it, and we can well, measure that, and we've been we able to measure that. We have a weir here that measures the seepage. Well, that measures the outflow, but are we able to measure that that's exactly what it does going through the... We don't have a direct measure right here, if that's what your question. We have a right. direct measure right here, 
And this measurement collects whatever's going through the core and whatever comes up from the rock. And we think during the summer it gets less than 10 gallons a minute. And we think most of that's coming from the rock. And so during the, the winter months, we get rainfall in here too, which percolates in here and gets up to 100 gallons a minute. But as soon as it stops raining, it stops, it stops this weir starts dropping down. Like I said, it's down to So rainwater is going through that white space? Yep. Yeah. Right. Down into the... Uh... So it, it goes all the way down here into, in, into this pool, internal pool that's measured and collected. It also percolates in here and it saturates that the dirtier materials here, which allows water to come. But we can say confidently that none of that water is coming from the other side of the. Well, we we are confident. Well, we know there's water percolating down into that lower end and comes out at the outflow. Yep. Right. Yep. And we can say confidently that none of that water is water that's coming from. None of the water going through the white area is coming from the other side there. Oh, there from the reservoir. Oh, there's a little bit of water coming through the core, but as soon as it hits the white area, it dribbles down and comes down here. Actually, it hits the rock, it comes down that deep, you know, that Congressman Amalfa was talking about. Water hitting here hits the rock, and then it flows down the top of the rock and is collected in the pool down here. And we know that because what? Well, first of all, this was the way it was designed, so that was the design's intent. And we know that, that this, this seepage rock here pulls water and only measures a certain amount. How much it measures matches exactly, almost exactly, what the properties of the core would tell us would come through. So that's consistent. We've had consistent uh, instruments here that uh, showed us that, that it was all dry. Right. But now those so don't work anymore. It was all anymore. dry here. These, these instruments here, which worked for 35 years, all show that it was always dry up here. So whatever water was coming through the core just dropped down. Okay. And it's just weeping. So, and when we could measure those, it showed dry. Yes. And, and actually, those tubes still are, are connected into this gallery here, and they're dry. If they were connected to water, they'd be dripping water, and they're not. So okay. it's still dry. So we also, in addition to these instruments, I don't have this slide here, but we had instruments here for measuring sediment, we had casings, and we can measure water levels in those casings, and they also measure that. So there's pretty much an overwhelming a set of information that tells us what, how the sequence is. The next steps for us is that now that we know that there's some, some uh, a little bit of wet spots you know, saturated here, how does that affect overall stability? So we've done stability analyses in the past, and now we can update them with, with, with additional information and more sophisticated analyses to look at that. Last real, real quick, the, uh, <clears throat> the density, the, the workhorse of the thing is that red portion, the core. Yep. Everything to the right is not really intended to be a water holding system. It's just holding the dam in place, Correct. more or less. So how dense is the material in the blue on the lake side of the red core there? Is that denser than the white area to the right? So this material looks pretty much like that material. Okay. Um, they replaced it. Um, certain parts were replaced at different times, but this is the same stuff that this is. There is a filter right here on both sides of the core uh, that is similar to these, but it's finer, so it's intended to filter this as well. So more, more dense than the white and the blue area, but not as dense by far as the red core area, right? So this, this material here, these have dry densities. You take, take a sample of that material and take the water out of it, just the soil part has dry densities between 145 and 155 pounds per cubic foot, which is equivalent to solid concrete. This is a very dense material. It was put in, and uh, it wasn't dumped. Some dams are dumped. But these were placed in lifts. Uh, this, the lift sizes were two feet, and they were, had, each lift was passed over with vibratory rollers to make it dense. 
And uh, they took this material and tested it at, at UC Berkeley in the 60s and 70s and, and tested Oroville down material. The shell here, zone three, and it has some of the highest strengths on record. For, and so it has uh, very high shear strengths. Does this satisfy FERC? Because, like you said, they keep bringing it up. They keep pointing to this green spot and saying, "We need to monitor. You need to monitor this. You need to provide us with your data." So, so the uh, and, and one of the people who recommended these studies, Dr. Mejia, is right there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> five years ago, Mejia's charge. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> you know brought up these issues and, and said you should study these and document these. And I think the department's position has been, we know a lot about this stuff, and we know what's going on. But I think, and I won't force your mouth a little bit, but I think the point was you need to document this better. And you have, a, you have all this information, tons of information, but it's not in concise documents that, that regulators like safety dams or FERC or independent consulting boards can look at. So go ahead and please document that. Do those studies, update them, and document. And that's what we're in the pro and I think that was a good rec set of recommendations. And so we're in the process of doing that. So the next generation won't have to go through the microphone records to find it. <laughs> Thank you, Les. Thanks, Les. So, the, so we're at 11 now, I know. <laughs> yeah, so I think there's a couple of items here I, I've proposed that we condense. One is we're going to go through, there was a request for a comment log. So we've prepared a comment log that has all the IRB comments. And then our, you know, we state if we, where we concur or whether we're, we're pending or whether we don't concur. And then we also say whether this is open or closed. And so this is a this is a snap. We're going to have a running log. This is a snapshot in time. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to hand this to Rob and let Rob distribute it to the group there. Um, and there's some you know, there's a little description on the front. And if you have questions, let me know. Um, this you know, this is something that we'll update. So it might look different as we work on this next time. Uh, our plan is to make this available to you uh, at each meeting. It's Print it out very smallly, so we'll also make an electronic version available to you as well. Good. The uh, so then the next item. So we, I'm going to propose we, we skip the break and we get we let the IRB do their presentation. Right. And then uh, then we can conclude with that. I know we I don't want to cut the ad hoc group short. I know we've been doing a lot of discussion as we go, but after the IRB goes, then we can take whatever time the ad hoc group would like for, for further discussion. Right. And then I think we can adjourn. So, Bruce, are you? I think they're getting the presentation pulled up for us right now. Um, maybe while they're pulling that up at the meeting earlier this month, the second meeting of the IRB, we welcome Dan Wade um, to, to the group. And so maybe Bruce, we'll just grab mic. Oh, yes, thank you. Okay. So maybe what we'll do is just ask Dan to stand up and, and maybe give a little bit of background, just like the rest of us did at the last uh, first meeting. All right, thanks, Bruce. Uh, good morning, Dan Wade. Um, good to be here. Bruce just asked me to let you know a little bit about who I am. Um, so I am a um, registered civil engineer and registered business engineer in the state of California. Um, studying in UC Berkeley, actually under some of the professors that worked on this facility, like Mike Duncan uh, and others. Then I went to Virginia Tech for uh, graduate studies to learn a lot more about this facility uh, because a lot of the, the work um, in geotechnical engineering uh, advanced during the, construction. Yeah. during the construction of this facility. <clears throat> I, um, in my career, I've been in dams and hydropower uh, for the entire, uh, for my entire career. First 18 years in the private sector, the last 12 years working for the city and county of San Francisco. Uh, we own and operate the Hetch Hetchy uh, water system. Uh, we have 18 dams as part of that system. I came to the city 12 years ago to help manage uh, what we call the Water System Improvement Program, which is a $4.8 billion program 
uh, to repair, replace, upgrade critical infrastructure associated with that system. Uh, we're about 96% complete with that. I'm the director of the program. I'm also overseeing a $2 billion 10-year capital improvement program uh, for the city and county of San Francisco. And so um, I think probably a unique perspective that I bring is um, having been in the private sector as a consultant working on these facilities as well as a representative of, a, of an owner agency um, implementing large infrastructure projects, working with a lot of stakeholder groups similar to this in implementing those projects. So that's a little bit about me. Thanks, Bruce. Great, thanks. And it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and I hope to be able to make a contribution um, in listening to, to the issues here today. Welcome aboard, and thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this morning, I, just to give you a little bit of context, you, you, this one? <laughs> All right, we'll get the right mic here. All right, so just for a little bit of context, being an independent board, um, a lot of what we've seen here this morning actually begins to respond to some of the things that we gave recommendations on just a few weeks ago. Um, so as you see some of the things that I'll summarize here, just recognize that some of the presentations you've seen earlier this morning are already beginning to deal with those issues. Um, not, not that we're out of sync or anything like that. We're just three weeks further down the road in a very rapidly developing study. Um, so just bear with us on that. So IRB members, just as a quick reminder, uh, Betty Andrews, um, uh, Lilio Mejia, uh, myself, Paul Schweiger, and Dan Wade. Some general observations at, at, at the second meeting that we saw. First of all, notable progress. Um, this is moving fast. Um, they are making significant progress in being able to address the prior recommendations. Um, I think one of the things that we were very happy to see while in our first board report, we had recommended a task seven. <coughs> um, they chose to go in a little bit different direction and just move that, what we suggested as a task seven, they moved it up to a project management activity. And so essentially what you're seeing is more study-wide activities that are taking place in order to integrate everything that's going on. Um, I think we see this as it's going to improve both the efficiency um, and the quality of the work that comes out of the study. All right, so let's get down to some of the specific recommendations. Um, they gave us a list, I think on this one, it was about six <coughs> questions. It was six or seven questions that, that they asked us to address. Um, the last one being a catch-all um, to just give us the opportunity to comment on anything that we wanted to comment on. So let me just uh, run through these real fast. Um, first of all, did we have any comments um, regarding the approach and the integration summarized in the materials given during the meeting? Um, we thought that the approach has been appropriately refined. I know there's some debate and some disagreement about what the overall scope is. I think our general feeling is that there are things that are directly related to dam safety, which I think was their intent of doing a comprehensive review. Um, and there are things that are related to other processes that are in play. And being able to kind of sort out which of those issues belong in which processes is very important for being able to get focused and move all of those processes forward in a way that's helpful to everyone. Um, we were pleased to see the linkages between the forensics, with the forensics team report and with the part 12 um, inspection. Uh, we think all of that information comes together in a way that will certainly help whatever recommendations come out of this particular uh, CNA study. And then finally, the appropriate continued emphasis on identifying what are those opportunities that when, if, if the team sees something that could be an immediate risk reduction um, that is within the purview of DWR to just address it, there seems to be a genuine commitment 
to identify those things as, as opportunities that they can address right away. The second question was on the project evaluation um, approach. This was something that we, in our first meeting, wanted to see more of an emphasis on getting the evaluation criteria laid out earlier in the process um, so that there could be no um, impression um, that the evaluation criteria was being developed in order to just justify whatever the recommendations were coming out of the report. We think having that on the table before the measures are identified, before the plans are put together, um, just adds more credibility to the process. Um, we did suggest one additional um, evaluation criteria, and that was permittability. Not so much about whether or not it's easy, more about just making sure that there's an assessment of what level of effort would be necessary to get permits to do some of the things that are being talked about. Um, just as one more evaluation factor to be considered. Um, the other thing that has already been eliminated when they gave us the presentations earlier this month was that there was a notion of primary evaluation criteria and secondary evaluation criteria. We recommended that that distinction be removed um, because in the decision-making process, the decision-makers themselves will make their determinations as to which criteria should be given the greatest weight. Um, this is kind of a classic problem of all water resources uh, management um, issues as you try to study them and try to make reasonable decisions. Um, I think there were some comments, I think it came in the discussion about recreation. My encouragement to all of you would be to think in terms of any, any one of those criteria has both what you would call objectives and it would have constraints. Certainly those things that are in the license agreement would be constraints. That if you're gonna violate something in the license agreement, that becomes a no-go for some of the measures. And so that's one level. The other level is an objective where you're trying to maximize how many objectives can be satisfied or the degree to which all of those objectives can be satisfied along the way. All right, the third question uh, was questions um, regarding the water control manual. The notion of the IRB is that the water control manual is a product of the Corps of Engineers. Certainly it has very strong linkages to what is recommended out of the CNA study here. Um, I think that the it's certainly wise to have interim operating plans, but to think that those could become the permanent solution, I don't see how that would ever replace the Corps of Engineers' responsibility um, for having a water control manual for the Feather River. Um, not without going through the full process, because certainly one of the things you run up against is it, and this is classic in water resources management, that it's really easy to go through and optimize the system for any one objective. But when you start to introduce multiple objectives, and, and you saw the list that DWR presented, you can't optimize for flood control and still provide water delivery. You can't optimize for those two and still provide recreation. Um, or you may severely limit what some of those other objectives are. This is the reason that it is so difficult for the Corps to work through the process of coming up with a water control manual. Um, one of the things that I didn't really hear emphasize very much this morning, the current water control manual has a fundamental assumption that Marysville Reservoir would have been built and would be providing additional flood control. So the reason that the current curves for Oroville, quote unquote, don't work, is you're missing a key part of what was envisioned right. in the original plan for the well, Feather just so River. You know, we've been saying that for years. I, mean, I, I understand. Morning, but, I, I understand, but. That is part of the fundamental flaw yeah. of what's going on. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that, um, and, and I'm not saying people aren't saying it, but 
to think that we can jump past that and take a temporary solution and make it the permanent fix without really addressing the fundamental underlying issue, I think, be careful of trying to do something like that. That's a, it's a dangerous proposition that has unintended consequences associated with it. Um, we also recommend looking at the, uh, the flood control outlet um, release limitation. It's really been based on the downstream uh, levy capacity, but that downstream levy capacity has been represented as a single number. Um, I don't think that 100, that if you put $150,000 or 150,000 CFS down the river, I don't believe that you can say with absolute certainty you can pass that with no trouble. I also think you can't say that at 150,001 CFS that they fail. And so we're just suggesting uh, looking at it in a little bit more probabilistic fashion that there's probably some number that you can have a very high degree of confidence in, and maybe that's the 150 number. Maybe that's how it was come up with. But there's probably some other set of numbers that begin to describe what might you be able to, to get down the river with some probability of not having severe failures. So just more of a risk management approach to it. Um, we agree with the limiting the uh, power plant outflows. Um, in our report, we kind of give some explanation as to why. That's a very common thing um, in terms of using power plants as outlets. And then finally, um, some consideration of measures to eliminate grid demand or grid failure as limiting factors in the power plant capacity. Um, because you're depending on the power plant for releases, one of the failure modes for, or that might prevent that is if for some reason you can't get power onto the grid. Um, for whatever reason that might be, how many redundancies do we have? What are the things that could potentially stop the power from getting to the grid? One thing actually brought up by DWR is apparently as you begin to make more and more releases down the river, the tailwater is going to come up in the river in order to get that capacity. Well, there's actually a tailwater elevation at which they have to shut down the power plant um, simply because the water is going to get up to a level where you either are outside the range for the operating um, or operations of the turbines or you're beginning to flood the power plant itself and you have to de-energize it. I, I, I think that's unclear. Your recommendation here, at least your summary, are, are you saying that the department should um, explore um, physical and operational changes, some of which have already been done, to ensure that they can, they have demand, uh, and therefore can use the powerhouse. That's that's what you're talking if, about. If, if Increase, you can't increasing send the, the gen, if you can't send the energy somewhere. Oh, I know that. You can't spin the turbines. So so, yeah. but but is the recommendation to, to then assume that? Essentially, you have a power failure, or that 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 the that the powerhouse capacity can't be used, or is the recommendation that that as part of the physical and operational changes that the comprehensive needs assessment work on, and that has already been worked on, to increase the reliability of actually having demand and being able to deliver demand to and therefore keep the power us running? So I think our recommendation at this point is to assess whether or not that's an issue. It may be that they have multiple okay. avenues of redundancy already, but before we start saying, you know, let's increase that redundancy or let's increase that reliability, let's get a good assessment of what the current situation is. Okay. Yeah. All right, the next one that we looked at is the analysis for the flood control headworks. Um, I think we feel very confident in their analysis of the um, stability of the headworks. Um, the one thing that we do recommend is because of the new PMF, the routings need to be run, and if there's a difference in res maximum reservoir elevation, 
that needs to be updated. The stability analyses need to be updated for a new um, situation given the, the new hydrology. Um, the second one is kind of a little bit different twist. So you can do all the stability analysis you want. You have a basic assumption that that monolith acts as a monolith, that it is a single structure and that if it's going to move, the whole thing moves together. One of the things that you have to take a look at is how do the stresses behave within that structure? Because it could be that you have some area within the structure that is weak under certain loading conditions, and if it fails before the rest of the structure fails, then you begin to get kind of an unzipping um, of the structure. And so what we agree with is that there's been a proposal for a nonlinear stress analysis. This was actually done at Folsom Dam for the new uh, joint federal project because they used um, the flood control outlet as the model for the new flood control outlet at Folsom Dam. And they did the stress analysis. The big concern there was how does it perform in an earthquake? And so what, what they found out is, yes, there are weak areas and there are areas you have to pay attention to. And so we think exactly that same type of analysis needs to be performed here so that there can be decisions about whether or not the existing structure is adequate for earthquake loads. Because the earthquake loads that it was designed for are far different than what we understand them to be today. And then finally, um, just a, coming up with a written plan for addressing seismic performance of the electrical and mechanical equipment. So I think they've talked a lot about the structure, the, the big gates themselves. The other piece of that is that there's a whole bunch of electrical and mechanical parts that are required to operate those gates and making sure that everything's going to perform uh, that it's anchored down, that you're not going to have pieces flying off um, in the event of an earthquake, that you're left with a facility that's still operational when the earthquake is over. All right, so task five on the embankment dam. Um, commendable effort by DWR to, to pull together all of the data um, regarding the seepage and stability issues identified in the Part 12D process. Um, we do recommend a little bit broader consideration of potential failure modes to determine if there are other issues that have not come up in the Part 12D process. Not that this isn't that there's a smoking gun or anything like that. It's just having kind of an open mind to things that might be raised as issues so that they can be chased down. It, it's the green spot, um, at which kind of comes in our third recommendation, is just this further documentation. And I think Les talked about that. They, they recognize the need um, to get this documented, get it out there to where it can be shared with people and give people a chance to read it for themselves, raise other questions. Um, I think that's what we see is the great opportunity is when this stuff gets documented and shared, not only do we get a better sense, um, I think we've heard a very good explanation, but it's always different when you put it on paper. Um, and so getting it on paper causes you to ask yourself a lot more questions um, and to have to be a lot more certain of, about what you're saying. And did we have any recommendations or questions on the work plan update? Um, so I think a commendable effort to assess things as to whether they're project-wide activities or task-specific activities. And finally, I think the thing we were really pleased to see was that there, there's a sense of schedule flexibility. This is a rapidly developing work plan. Um, they've, they've just dove in and have begun putting this study together. 
and it's rapidly evolving, they're still identifying what are all the tasks that need to be performed. Not, not in the sense of the six tasks, but there are activities within each one of those tasks. So what are all those activities that need to be performed? What we were happy to see is as they begin to flesh out what those activities are, that there seems to be some flexibility in the schedule to make sure that the proper quality work gets done in order to answer the questions. And I, we were happy to see that there isn't some end date that causes us to say, mm -hmm. you know what, mm -hmm. we can only do X amount of analysis mm -hmm. and still get it done by that end date. Mm -hmm. um, so this is really encouraging to us to see that there's a commitment to, to that kind of quality. And then finally, just under the, the other recommendations, we thought it was really useful to see an outline of, of the, um, at least the, a very high level outline of what the final report would be for the CNA study. And we've just encouraged that that become a topic for all of our um, reviews. Every time the board meets, just present us with how that outline is being fleshed out so that we know what to expect to see in there. I think it also helps to kind of drive the teams to know what's the information they need to be putting together to fill out uh, that outline and, and generate that report at the end of the day. So with that, I, anybody want to add anything cool. else that I missed? Okay. Elevator. All right, questions? Yeah, can I ask a process question? Yeah. Um, so thanks for putting together the little comment log. That's a great idea and super helpful. Um, some of these comments date back to June 19th, and all of them are open. Um, and I know that we've got a schedule to keep and things go through different phases. Some of these questions are really oriented towards beginning stuff, like evaluation criteria and things of that nature. Um, it seems like there should be some window of opportunity to either agree, concur, and implement, as opposed to just kind of leaving things open for an unextended period of time. Have there been any discussions about what's a reasonable horizon to kind of leave things open and in, in process and things of that nature? Yeah, the, or, let's see go. I can start with that. With, so the idea here is we, we list on there in addition to being, I think I have a mic actually. In addition to being open or closed, we do note where, we're, where we concur or also where we're, uh, we're, we're, we're thinking about it, trying to take it under consideration. And so the way we have this set up is we'd like the board to close the items. So since we just put this together here, we want to circle back with the board. And so there are items on there that right now from the department standpoint, we think we have addressed that, but it's, this is not the department closing these items. It's just we're looking to the board to close them. Um, is there a way, because we only have quarterly meetings, to maybe online or somewhere have it so that we can kind of track what's still open, what's closed? Because again, you're, you're, you've got things that are happening monthly and we're meeting quarterly. So for us to kind of stay up to date on, on what's happening or not happening, that would be helpful. Right. I, think that's, I think that's something we could look at putting online. So on the website, we could do some periodic update then, maybe more frequently than the quarterly that we're... Because okay. I, I know just from my perspective, a lot of the comments that the review board has I, I agree with, and uh, the question is, are they being implemented, and how would we see those things manifested? So it seems like you've got that structure set up in this table. It would just nice to be able to see the closure, and yes, in fact, it is implemented, and here it is. Yeah, that seems reasonable. And so, Sergio, maybe one of the things to consider um, for the, the next board meeting is just having a part of the agenda that is set aside. Um, for what your proposed status is, and then as part of us writing our report, um, we can easily um, concur or, or give any clarifications. That, that's, that's what we were planning on. Okay. Uh, for, for the, uh, for the third meeting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so as John mentioned, we just put this together. Um, when, when we first had the agenda, we had closed with the question mark. So we thought that that would, that would uh, raise a lot of questions, so we just left them open because we are looking to the board to close them. Yep. So I, I think process-wise, just another one of those cases, the, the board only meets so often and things rapidly develop in between meetings. Any other questions? Does that mean the board needs to meet more frequently? 
I don't know that we need to meet more frequently. Um, I, I know personally my notion is I would really like to see them have time to get some things accomplished so that when we do meet, um, there's meaningful progress. Um, and, and I think, honestly, their commitment at DWR has been to have you all meet every time we meet. Um, so so I, I think it at least seems to me, from an outsider looking in, that this seems to be set up in a reasonable fashion. All right, well, so our, our remaining agenda items is, I was just gonna go through, and I think everyone can just read this as well as I could read it to you. So here's the dates of what's coming up leading up to the next meeting. So any questions, of course, Rob and I can. Well, I think we this. discussed that we had expanded to a four week time frame yes. in response to allow more time for the ad yeah. hoc Yes. To, okay. That's one, yeah, that is one change from the last one. More time for you guys to pull together your thoughts and provide those to us. Uh, so then, with that item out of the way, then the remaining item is, is if there are any questions or discussion, then from the ad hoc group. Um, you saw that memorandum that got circulated, and then I'm pleased to see that basically task three addresses most of those items there and that's what I want to see that those things that had to do with the seepage and, and the green spots and evidently whatever that process is that they're talking about with the casement drilling and all that would be addressed before you know with the IRB so that we can gain a confidence in because if they took the time to explain it while we we're on the tour it must be important enough that but I want to know that it, it has the experts endorsement that it's it's accurate and and believable that when we ultimately go out the community is going to be looking somewhat to the ad hoc committee to give lack of a better term testimony to the mm -hmm. fact that that they've looked at this and they've there's reasonable things you know pronouncements being made and that, that they can uh, look for safe and reliable operation that's uh, the the major objective uh, the other thing, I guess, on the, the uh, river valve, that will come up and be examined within the physical facilities. So I feel like those things are being addressed, particularly after seeing the task three uh, summary there. Uh, I, I feel like that, that is being addressed, but I think it gives the IRB some recognition of why we want to know about it. Sure. So um, I think we're going in the right direction there. Good. Now on things that are blessed by either the review board or the department, it's always nice to have a stamp and a signature by, by a PE just so we know that there's some credibility and substantial support and accountability behind an analysis or report or as opposed to just a general memo. Yeah, what do, you, what do people feel about that? So that's a good question, and I guess we're just reacting to that right here. Off, I believe, and other folks jump in, but where we do studies, that would. Yeah. Okay, why don't you? I don't have a microphone, but I'll talk loud. Um, okay. Yeah, it's our intention that the you know the engineering reports and studies that are conducted will be signed by a licensed engineer. And I think one of the changes we made, you know, recently was, Ted. Well, I don't mean, Ted is a registered civil engineer, and he is now the executive manager over dam safety and risk management for the overall state water project. And then we've elevated Dave Sarkeesian in a higher level manager over the dam safety program. So really, as things are going up to exe when we, you know, executive, it's been vetted through senior executive people who have the credentials to, you know, to, to recommend. Right, and I think it's more to the, you know, certifying that, hey, what is being stated is it correct? I don't want to speak for you, Rune, but that someone is certifying as an engineer that, yeah, these calcs look, you know, to show what they purport to show, like, you know, right? I mean, these calcs support what is being recommended or what is being affirmed or confirmed, right? Is that... That's it. You got yeah. it. It's like a chain of custody, right? I, I vouch for all this information. Right. 
And I, I don't know if it, I don't think we've seen it, but you know, I know there was a lot of data collected and, you know, uh, as far as the anchors and the, uh, the dra viewing the drains, is that something that we could see from the ad hoc to, I mean, I understand you guys have reviewed it as well, is that right? I mean, the IRB has or has not reviewed that uh, information? Not yet. Okay. I mean, at some future date, I'm, that's something that we'd like to see, like, hey, that obviously they're saying, yeah, this shows that the assumptions are correct, right, I think is what we were getting at. Um, that this head, head works facility is, you know, competent, doesn't need to be replaced, I guess. Is, that's really what we're looking at, right? Uh, I think we're going to have to continue to work together because at, you know, at some level, when we have those technical studies, I'm speaking real broadly here, just the common risk is where we're identifying specific risks, specific measures in a lot of granular detail, that's where we get the, start getting the security concerns. And so that's where I just want to, I don't want to commit at the, the outset here that, yeah, every analysis we do, we're going to be able to share with you because this group, because what we do share here, we expect that to be, to be public. We have to treat it that way. So that's where we're going to have to work together to make sure with the IRB, with you, that we, we have a level of, of comfort on what, what's happening here. Um, right. but, but can I add to that, John? I think I'd kind of want, I mean, I believe Rune is the only engineer on our, on our ad hoc, yeah. so. Or Larry. And Larry, sorry, sorry. I knew I was gonna mess that up. Um, <laughs> but maybe if it's something that, obviously, it's gonna be something that I'm not gonna really know, you know, but for them who, people on our board that have that expertise, maybe if it's something that they can look at and just go, hey, yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, I think as long as it's not CEII data, then we, there's no reason we shouldn't. But I think another thing that we're trying to do, and obviously we're breaking ground in the industry, is bringing in another expert to help us develop a risk communication plan. So how do we take what's really complicated engineering but turn it into information? Because all of this, eventually we got to turn it into information we can provide to you guys and the public that they can understand. And so, and I'm not calling it, you know, dumb it down, but really put it into a perspective that is understandable. So we've taken that on because I think all dam owners need to be able to provide that information to all the sheriffs, all the local inmates. So we need to do that. So we're working on that. That's right. Um, I appreciate that, that's, Joel, because that's why I, have, I ask half the questions I do, just to get it down into mm -hmm. an English that people that are watching us or you know can appreciate this is what we're what our objectives are you know what, whatever it may be and I think you guys are probably one of the most educated now on this dams stuff than the, most of the other uh, areas so I think it's really important we've taken it on and maybe that can help address that assemblyman it's probably not the whole answer you're looking for but I think we're putting all these pieces together to be well, able to better Joe, communicate. You, you, this, this group is probably a good resource for you in development oh, yeah. of that program. You've got general community folks who are interested and engaged, and you can use them as a sounding board. And you know, well, well, why don't we work this together as a collaborative as opposed to going out and hiring said consultant, your task is this, come back and tell me the answer. No, I, I think, I mean, you're right. We're, this is where we're going to introduce that plan, build it with you guys. <coughs> but we still need arms and legs, people helping us get it done. And, sure. And yeah, so, yeah. But yes, this is where we would be vetting that process. Well, not just vetting, but also developing the methods and strategies and tools. This is a good resource for you. The iterative process. Yeah. Don't, don't overlook this as a resource is what I'm saying. Yeah, got it. Joe, if you'd be so kind, get the heads up to Director Nemeth. I'm going to give her a call. I'd like to sit down with her and uh, James and, and uh, the appropriate people and talk about the levy and okay. dredging money and how we program that out to be expended. I, I want to track that in the budget very carefully. I will, sir. Thank you. Yeah. I, I do have one other question, oh, uh, John, and it has to do with... Um, the 12D is a periodic, regularly occurring thing, and I was just wondering why that caused the um, schedule extension 
since it, it is known to come up, it, what right. made it different? So, uh, the, so the, the legislation said in the Part 12D, you need to do a risk assessment in this particular, following this particular set of FERC guidelines. And so at the same time in our CNA process, we were needing to do a risk assessment. And so what the, the approach was, instead of doing two separate risk assessments, which is, is time consuming and you're concerned about how those would jive together, the thought is let's use the, the risk assessment that we're now required to do by, by FERC, use that assessment to then- Decision inform. to integrate it then. Yeah, okay. so that way we do one assessment Okay. But but the result was it meant we had to adjust the, the, the timing of the schedule, the processes, so hence the, hence the delay. The follow-up to that is the uh, supplemental uh, problem uh, failure mode study that was required. What, what, what's the status of that study, the supplementary? Yeah, let's see. I, I can talk to that. So we did a supplemental PFMA as part of the uh, spillway uh, reconstruction work. This was done um, back in, I believe it was May of, of 2017. Uh, that uh, process you know, was completed. Um, we'll be providing that document to the next uh, Part 12D board, um, and they'll be reviewing that document as well as our other uh, potential failure mode uh, documents that have been prepared in the past. And using that as part of the, the new potential failure mode analysis done as part of the Part 12D process in the January to March timeframe uh, next year. Our, our question three that was uh, submitted following last meeting um, requested information on those uh, different reports so that we could follow along, that we can get up to speed knowledge-wise. I was able to find a 2014 report, was not able to find the supplementary report on the online. Has that gone public? Yeah, so um, we had went through the process. So those reports contain, you know, basically a list of potential, you know, failure modes for the facilities. And so the 2014 one, we went through the process of, of you know, redacting it so that the, the materials that we placed publicly wouldn't get into the wrong hands, you know, for people that right. might have bad intentions for the facilities. Um, the, the supplemental uh, report, we would need to go through a similar process, um, and it, it takes time and resources to, to go through that redaction process. Um, the, that, that report was very focused on the spillway construction, um, and, and as we've gotten past the spillway construction, we really see the, you know, the next potential failure mode analysis that's done in, in 2019 is really being the broader, broader one, Matt. I just want to follow up with a couple of um, action items I just want to make sure are noted in this meeting. Uh, first of all, I just want to make sure that Congressman LaMalfa's request for the information, documentation, photos on the dam being built on solid bed rock, if we could get that. And then the other item that was brought up earlier was this the recent letter from FERC dated October 25th to you, Mr. Craddock, from Mr. Blackett. Um, and Matt brought this up about uh, incorporating that in the uh, winter flood operations, a water operations plan, that that would be looked at and, and either incorporated or not or commented on, that, that those be taken as the two action items that I see from earlier. Thank you. Any questions? No, we, we understand that okay. request, Laura, and, and we'll document and follow up on that. Thank you. If I may, I think there's one thing that we can all agree on, it came out several times today, that the operations manual that's currently in effect is um, antiquated and incomplete. It didn't consider that, uh, for one thing, that the Marysville Lake was built, and it didn't consider uh, climate change as it is. And it seems that we could all agree that forecast-informed reservoir operations is the future, and that public safety being number one, thanks for moving that, Assemblyman, my Congressman is here, <laughs> um, to the forefront that we could agree that we need to work on speeding that process up. And it seems like just to go to the public and say, even in the interim, that DWR and everyone's willing to manipulate the operations to keep us safer. Um, 
I hope we can all agree on that, and I think we could all work together on that. Bluntly, uh, meeting with the Army Corps, with the Senator and the Assemblyman in Washington, D.C., they were very less than receptive to climate-based forecasts scientific operations and very linear in their responses to us. So I think there's something we got to work on together there. But I think I can leave here thinking that we are all on the same page. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. No mas for me. Well, uh, yeah, thank everybody again for spending the time. Uh, there was a lot of meaty topics here you know and i think so Good. one we want to kind of take some time to process that and go through some of the stuff and get some of our comments and we've given you some today that i think are, are very good um but we want to take some time to get you back some other feedback and comments and I, again That's i good. appreciate everybody the presentations you know we're very thorough and we appreciate that well thank you all very much great all right good, good talk. Good thank you good to see you good today. Today.